want to use my microphone. All right, call the meeting to order. All right, I call to order the October 17, 2017 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board. Uh, I'm going to ask the board, I would like to add one thing to the agenda, and that is um, under approval of minutes, the minutes from the um, workshop on October 3rd that you should have had a copy at your seat or you received one in the in an email in the past yeah. couple days. Do you need a motion? No, just a just a nod of heads. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right, first item, um, approval of minutes for the September 19, 2017 meeting. Any changes, arrows, omissions? Seeing none, anyone want to make a motion? I move we accept the, the minutes. Second. Okay, I have a mo motion to accept the minutes and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor? All right. No one's was unanimous, so I won't go on to the next. Okay, minutes of the the October 33, 2017 workshop. And the reason we have minutes, we don't usually have minutes from workshops, but at this workshop we uh, had a discussion and made a decision to look at Old Sea Point Road uh, as an expedited uh, review. So, um, so we have a minute. Any any questions, errors, omissions, comments on these minutes? Seeing none, <coughs> do I have a motion? Motion to accept the minutes. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. All right, Victoria seconds. All right. Okay, all those in favor? Uh, it's unanimous. All right. Through that. First item on the agenda, Maxwell Woods Residential Development. Maxwell Woods LLC is requesting a major subdivision final plan review, amendments to the previously approved Spurling Woods subdivision, a resource protection permit, and site plan review of 38 condominium units and two four-unit apartment buildings located at 112 through 114 Spurling Avenue. Section 16-2-4, major subdivision review public hearing. Section 19-8-3, resource protection public hearing and section 19-9 site plan review public hearing. So for public hearing, we ask that people come to the podium and we limit your comments to three minutes. You need to give your name and your address. And uh, I will now open the public hearing for comment. Is there anyone who wishes to speak? Hi, Paul Seidman, 21 Oakview Drive. I had seen something about soil samples relative to farmland definitions, and I was wondering if it were the case, and I'm, I haven't read enough about it, if it were the case that the land was not farmable, um, would it make sense to have it as open space, accessible open space, just sort of in the interest of um, serving the needs of the public? Thank you. My name is Peter Dixon. I live on uh, uh, 29 Westminster Terrace, and I have a similar comment. Um, <clears throat> if we reclassify the 2.07 seven acres as simply open space, it's a win-win-win. The developer retains his right to open space. The current landowner retains private ownership and compensation for the real estate deal. The town gains public access to an open space uh, that is preserved for the natural state. It will also help add with the greenway from um, across, this, uh, across the town. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak? Are there many people in the audience who wish to speak on this? I'm just asking to expedite things. Could you please? Form a line by the windows, and uh, so you can be ready to speak as soon as your turn comes. Thank you. 
Right, go ahead. Good evening, uh, Becky Fernald. Um, I live on Mitchell Road in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, <clears throat> and I was, um, can you hear me? <laughs> I was wanted to address the um, open space as it is a uh, strongly valued community goal that has been established um, through many town surveys and through our future uh, open space preservation committee. Um, and that committee, the FOSS committee, defined open space as land and water areas, either public or private, maintained in an essentially undeveloped state for use as active or passive recreation, wildlife habitat, agriculture, or preservation. And I know I've spoken on this numerous times before, but I really believe that um, in this development, Meant the majority of the open space that's designated is not um, what is considered uh, an undeveloped or natural state. Uh, the land that's is most of the land is being transformed from um, a forest in its natural state into lawn area, and um, there are most of it is not large contigu contiguous blocks which the zoning ordinance um, stipulates. And the only large contiguous block in this development is this two acre parcel, which I know there's been, um, you've had received a lot of comments about it. Now you're, you're classifying it as an agricultural easement, yet um, I believe that even though um, the, uh, the family that owns it would retain ownership of it, uh, they could still retain ownership of it as open space, get compensated for that land, and this would be far more beneficial for the public because now there would be public access. The way it stands now, there'd be no public access to that land, and from what I understand, it's really not suitable for farming. Um, it's an overgrown meadow, and there's woods and wetlands on that. Uh, it um, hasn't been farmed for years. And um, if it's just being used to store some equipment, wouldn't it be a better use and better public benefit to have it be kept in its natural state and allow public access? Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, Diana Stern, 1 Columbus Road. And um, I believe that I, I was on the site visit for this development a few weeks ago, and I thought it was kind of interesting that even during the site visit, we did not actually set foot on the land. It was treated like private property. It was kind of pointed out in the distance. We had to look through the trees, and it looked like kind of a nice meadow. So um, I thought that was interesting, and I, I think it, it seems to me like it's pseudo open space. It meets the, um, I guess, the legal requirement now with the new zoning change of being open space, but really it is pseudo open space. And I would urge the board to make it true open space either by, um, well, at least by allowing public use of this and I mean, even there, it's pretty becoming a pretty densely developed area, and we could at least use it as like a dog park or, or something. I mean, um, they're, they're, we're used to a lot of woods in that area. They're all gone, which is fine. The development is allowed, but it just seems like open space is what the town has set as a priority, and we could certainly use open space in this area. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me, I didn't get your last name. Stern, Diana Stern, 1 Columbus Road. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Larry Stern. I also live at 1 Columbus Road in Cape. I have attended several hearings and also went on the recent site visit. I want to thank the planning board for all their hard work. I know you don't get paid very well for all this. Um, I wanted to emphasize also um, just my thoughts on this. I think that there may be some real benefit that I don't understand for the farm family to hold on to this land. Um, and that um, I, I get that, I support farms in this community, but I think we have to weigh 
the advantage to that family against the potential advantage to the community to have that land as real uh, open space with public access. Um, I think we have to, you know, uh, obviously the private parties have the right to develop that land. It's on private property. But I think that it is um, important for both the planning board and all city officials to consider also whatever they can do to protect the general public interest, not just the farm interest in that land and what is best for all people in the community. Surely we all benefit from having the additional tax dollars that this development will contribute to the community. I get that. But there is another a big value for people in this town is the great open space in this town. That's one of the reasons we all want to live here, because of the woods, because of the open space. And I think that whenever we're doing this kind of thing, we need to think, how can we best protect the rights of the people of Cape Elizabeth uh, to that open space? Not just the rights of the farmers, not just the rights of the developers, but also the rights of all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Andrew Gilbert, 32 Astor Lane. I know I've emailed people before on this project. Um, I have a few things. One that people haven't touched on yet, the, the road access to the project. I know it's been stated that it will be put in as the first phase of it, but I would strongly urge the planning board to make sure that it is very, very clearly written in there that the, the road for, con for construction and demolition and whatever else needs to happen is actually done first so that all those trucks and vehicles are not coming through the rest of the neighborhood. Um, it's definitely a safety issue. I think anybody in that neighborhood would agree. <clears throat> Secondly, I know people have talked about the, the farmland. I actually don't have a problem with farmland being set, uh, used as open space, but I would ask that it be stipulated that it actually is used as farmland and not held as a space to store tractors or cars or piles of dirt and refuse from farming. Um, that just ends up being kind of an eyesore. It's a small, it's a very small plot. I mean, two acres is really not that big. Um, <clears throat> sort of, I, it was really hard to tell from the site, site walk what actually was the two acres and what wasn't. But from my view, um, walking past that area, there was basically that farm equipment, large piles of dirt. Uh, you know, I don't know what actual um, public use that has. Um, not much in my mind. Um, lastly, um, now, I mean, this is actually legal according to Maureen, the, the classification of basically yards surrounding condominiums being included in open space calculations to me doesn't pass the straight face test. It, it actually is, is fine according to the ordinances, but I would think that in future projects you might give it a bit more thought because I'm not actually sure what, who that's actually serving. Um, to me, uh, open space as uh, just sort of preserved forest or um, agricultural field makes a lot more sense than somebody's backyard. It's been told to me that somebody's private residence yard can't be counted in that way. Um, to me, I don't know how that's any different, to be honest. So um, that's, that's all I needed to say. Thanks. Excuse me. I did not Get your Andrew Gilbert. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Becky Byers for Franklin Circle. And I also want to speak to the execution of the um, construction. Um, so I second the gentleman ahead of me saying make sure the construction road goes in first. Um, and secondly, when they do remove the trees, uh, to make sure that the the, bar the, um, the barriers between, or the buffer, sorry, the buffers between existing homes and the, the to-be-constructed uh, condos and apartments is, is truly a buffer. Um, I was eyewitness to the last destruction of the forest, and um, what happened was they took trees too close to the edge, and then after the trees were all removed, more trees blew over because there wasn't enough of a buffer. You know, trees all support each other at the roots, and I just want to take that, you know, I want the construction people to take that into consideration. I don't know how much control you have over that, but I just wanted to say that for the record. Thank, Thank you. you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak? 
Okay, I will close the public hearing and go to the item I should have gone to first <laughs> and have the client summarize changes since the last meeting, answering con questions and concerns. Uh, good evening, Madam Chair and members of the board. My name is Lee Lowry. I'm here um, pretending I'm Owen uh, McCullough tonight, so you're in trouble. Uh, I'm an attorney for Joel. been working with Joel for probably 20 years at this point, or 25 years, I guess I'd say. I haven't said anything significant yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, I just wanted to... I'm going to, I'll come back to the, uh, um, to the comments about that the public has made, uh, but I just wanted to briefly state our purpose. We're here uh, this evening hoping that the board and expecting that the board will be issuing final subdivision resource protection site plan review um, approval for this project. Um, the project itself has been here starting in January of this year, February couple of meetings, uh, a site walk and a meeting in February. Preliminary plan approval was May. I think at that point the uh, app, Joel was back um, pursuing his DEP permit. Uh, conditional approval was given on June 12th for, I think, conditional preliminary plan or final plan approval. And on September 28th, <coughs> he was back once again to review the final plan submission and uh, right after that meeting, he submitted his, uh, I think one of the outstanding issues at that point was the DEP approval, which was submitted, issued on the 23rd and submitted by a cover letter on the 29th. Um, since the uh, September meeting, um, uh, the presentation at that and the details of the plan uh, are summarized in Sebago Technics memo to the board of August 31st. There haven't been any um, material changes to the plan since that date or any of the other provisions. We have uh, worked with the uh, town attorney, Mike Hill, on revising and clarifying some of the uh, deeds regarding conservation easement or open space um, provisions that are going to go uh, along with the plan as well as uh, a utility easement for the outlawed and so forth. Um, I didn't hear anything formal back from Mike, but we sort of ended our discussion uh, today on that. Um, as we said, the DEP permit has been submitted. That was a precondition for this board to uh, review final plan and do approval. Um, one of the items that came up at the last meeting, I understand, was a discussion about the, um, is this still up? ACP. ACP? And then what? Just enter. Great. Um, this is going to be a little hard to see on this uh, dimension and the pointer is gone. Is that right? It's there. Okay. So on the plan, I think the discussion had to do with the um, road coming out here and uh, a neighbor from across the it myself okay so here's where the uh, the proposed new road Astor Lane the extension of Astor Lane will run into Spurwink a neighbor across the street um, talked about headlights and the initial um, and it was uh, Mr. Joe Baum, I believe this was his name, according to the minutes of the meeting. Um, he was concerned about headlights coming into his home. They went back, uh, they, uh, Sebago Technics went back to review it and looked at the um, uh, angles and where, how the headlights were situated. Well, it turned out that uh, we had misidentified uh, who the actual uh, neighbor was that was uh, having the discussion. So here's the intersection. It was thought from the meeting that it was this property owner that was making the con raising the concern about headlights and because they were coming at the directly into the garage. Da, da, da. 
It turns out it was uh, this neighbor here, apparently, at least according to the minutes of the uh, meeting, apparently concerned about vehicles coming this way, and I guess as headlights, car makes a turn, concerned that perhaps headlights were going to shine towards their home. We were considering whether there was something we could do here. Turned out the answer is uh, there wasn't anything we could do. Um, and I think if you review uh, Section D11 of, of uh, Maureen's uh, memo, she goes through and details pretty accurately the constraints upon relocating or any relocation of this right of way here which um, actually shows on the tax maps. It was a, uh, uh, a roadway that the two property owners, um, the Littles on one side and the uh, 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 Bamfords on the other, worked out as part of their estate planning for the division of this larger family property so that instead of having to, they could each have some property um, here uh, from the homestead. Uh, this was a very carefully designed right-of-way. It was designed to match up with this. It has to respect the pond and the wetlands. And as Maureen's memo says, the, this is essentially the only location where this right-of-way can enter and meet, you know, avoid any other uh, negative impacts or impacts that would be prohibited under the ordinance. Probably why it was there designed to begin with several years ago. So. Um, we just wanted to address that, that one concern that came up from the last meeting. Uh, I would uh, then move to the discussion um, about the, uh, just to respond to a couple of the concerns about the um, talked about agricultural easement. First of all, we, we didn't make up what the ordinance provides. I know that the council, after getting input from the planning board, did go back and clarify parts of it that are um, being being used for this project, but they will apply to any other farmland as well that may um, be involved in a project. Um, one of the questions was whether or not soil samples, uh, whether this was really farmland. I don't think for purposes of determining the benefits of open space, it has to meet the soil characteristics, farm, farm properties. This is an agricultural use property, and uh, I don't think many farms would survive if they didn't have uh, ancillary uses to uh, support their equipment and their buildings and so forth. And they probably wouldn't want to use prime farmland for those functions. And that's, in fact, what's taking place here. Um, uh, so there were a couple of comments along that line. We, we, think, we think the land here clearly, clearly meets the definition of agricultural use, and this is an appropriate use of that provision of your ordinance. Um, one of the, com one of the, a couple of folks have commented that, um, oh, if it was open space, then the, um, the owner could get compensated for the open space. Well, the entire discussion and negotiation surrounding the contract here had to do with the use of the agricultural use, uh, agricultural land open space provision um, so in one sense, the owner is being compensated for the benefits it's providing to this project, which just happen, just are not the bonus provision. I think uh, you've seen in the presentation that in theory, or as a matter of your ordinance, um, Joel would actually be, Maxwell Woods would actually be entitled to do three more units that he's not used. That's a bonus provision. He's not using that. He's just using the open space on the straight open space calculations. Um, and that's how the owner is being compensated. Um, as well as the owner is, um, another one of the other comments is, well, why, why isn't there um, that being opened up to the public? Well, it's, um, it's farm agricultural use property. We, the owner does not want to have the public wandering around on the property itself. There's not, a, there's not a limit on how much of that two point whatever acres can be used for those purposes. Um, and to encumber it with open, uh, with easements to the, 
to the general public at this point um, is not appropriate and it's not actually part of what's called for under the agricultural use uh, provisions. So uh, we think that's inapposite right now. Um, I'm just trying to summarize these other There was a question about yards. I, I guess our only answer, why are yards considered open space or what appear to be yards? Um, that's what the ordinance provides. It's been used many times in your town and to very good effect. And, and projects are better because of it. Um, and th there was a comment that the actual trail was just sort of walking around in uh, not a wasteland, but very uninteresting property. My understanding, and Joel may knows the property certainly better than I do, but that the actual pedestrian easement that goes uh, around the condominium project is going to be in a wooded area. It's not going to be out in, a, in the lawn or in just sort of a walking through a field. Um, so it has some appeal and some interest, and I think that's been reviewed um, certainly by the, you must have seen it on your site walk as well as in, in the planning reviews. So with that, um, because there are so few changes, um, we'd be happy to answer questions that the board has, but we are requesting that the board um, take a vote on this uh, application tonight and grant approval. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to open it up to the board for questions and comments. Go ahead, Peter. <coughs> yeah, the, uh, excuse me, the, to me, the, the primary focus from the comments is the open space issue, which I, I think deserves a, a complete explanation <coughs> to the board and, and for the board's making a final decision. Um, Maureen, I'm going to say something, to correct me if I stray from accuracy here. The open space uh, requirement and the calculation uh, is a mathematical calculation and what you count as open space is described in the ordinance. Uh, open space and public access, uh, as I understand it, are not synonymous. You can have qualifying open space that has no public access whatsoever. Um, so I can, I can, I appreciate the comments people made about it. It'd be so nice to have the people be able to have a dog park or whatever done in that agricultural area, but I'm not sure that's required. The one thing, though, that I, I do have a trouble with in the ordinance, and perhaps you could explain this, um, it says access to open space must be made available to the homeowners of the residential development, and it's strongly encouraged to be made available to the public, and such access may be limited consistent with open space priorities. Uh, I, I wasn't able to lay my hands this evening on the document that creates the easement, the agricultural easement on that two acre parcel. Um, my understanding is that the, there will be no public access, but my question is, is there access to the uh, homeowners in the development? And if not, how can it then qualify as open space in the formula? Or is, are you relying on that last clause in the sentence limited consistent with open space priorities, which agriculture, you don't want people trampling the rutabagas or whatever's being grown. Yes, so I'm gonna work backwards on sure. that. So the, the challenge with the requirement that open space must be available to the members of the development is unfortunately something, well, we usually, the town of Cape Elizabeth finds a way to work around that because the way that we calculate our open space is grounded in the town's right to impose impact fees. And impact fees have been constrained by decisions of the U.S. Supreme Court in the 1990s. And those decisions basically said that the requirement for things like open space must have an essential nexus to the impact of a proposed development. What that means is, and, and there, are, there are places in, I believe it was the Nolan and the Nolan and the Dolan decisions, the Irishman, um, where there was an acquisition by a government for public access. And the court says you couldn't require that it be accessible to the public. 
You can only require that it's accessible to the development that is creating the impact. True. So that's why we, we have to put in here that it must be at a minimum accessible to the residents of the development. However, what we really would prefer is that it be accessible to all. And there are only a few times where the planning board has not been able to um, convince a developer that the public should have the same access as the residents of the neighborhood. So that's how we use that line. So but, I'm going to go for that for one. Yeah, but, but tell me why, in this case, even the residents of the development are not going to have access to that agricultural and parcel. And I'm going to point to um, the section where we talk about the types of preservation that we have. Land to be preserved is open space. We talk about contiguous land, connectivity, and then the third criteria is preservation priorities. And our first priority for the type of land we want preserved is wetlands and environmentally sensitive areas, wildlife habitat. Our second priority is agriculture. Our third priority is greenbelt and recreation area. And then if you go to the permanent open space protection section, that's where we lay out what the legal requirements for how you protect that open space is already identified. And we explicitly say under restricted activities that there are things that you can restrict on that open space based on the type of activity um, that's allowed. And under, let me find it. Two, D A B uh, two, I believe. Yes, yep. that's right. Um, Is that correct? No. no. Activities on open space shall be restricted to preserve the open space from future development. And it explicitly says you can't have development, you can't have structures on it. However, you can do other things. So we, we roll out that even though you say you can't have a structure on open space, you can still build a viewing platform, which is a, could be considered a structure on wetlands. You can still build a barn or a shed in agricultural land. Um, you can still build an overlook for scenic character. So we create exceptions within the umbrella of what the open space is allowed. And it's not, I don't believe it's explicitly said here that you don't have to have public access to agricultural land. But it says that agricultural may include the tilling of fields and animal grazing. And our reports from the farming community is that when you are tilling land, there are actual USDA restrictions on allowing the public to gamble through your fields, especially with their dogs, who aren't carrying little plastic bags. <laughs> so, does it say here explicitly that you, it's okay not to have public access for agricultural land? No, it does not. But I believe it implies it clearly that you, you can relate the restrictions on the property to the purpose for which you are preserving it. And because the purpose is agriculture, it would make sense that the public would not have the type of access they normally would have. Okay, well, if that's inferential rather than explicit, I can accept that. Um, but if the land is not being farmed, or if only a portion of it is being farmed, is it not conceivable to be consistent with the requirement of land of the homeowner access to simply provide that the holder of the agricultural property can designate areas for which the public is not permitted to, and, to and use. Again, I've been educated, especially on the Future Open Space Preservation Committee, about what it means to be agriculture land. And I believe that the general public's opinion of agriculture is its tilled soil. But what farmers will tell you is that farms are made up of lots of different things. Sure. And this particular uh, piece of property has been tilled in the recent past. We have testimony from the applicant's representative that it's been tilled in the recent past. So if you look at the aerial photos, it's obvious that this area has been kept clear of trees and vegetation, which easily would have encroached on it because everything around it is trees. Um, we know that people let farm fields rest. We know that farm families will reopen fields. And I can think of farms where the new generation has grown up and is opening up farm fields that have laid fallow. But your, your draft easement 
which has been approved by your town attorney, says that it can be agricultural land and when it ceases to be agricultural land for three years, then the town can take it over as just plain open space. So the town attorney has weighed in on this topic and yes. with that provision in the, in the documentation, uh, he's comfortable. Right, and, and I should make it clear that we have a draft easement, we're required to have a draft easement, but the planning board doesn't approve the easement. Okay. Um, the easement gets reviewed by the town attorney, gets reviewed by the town manager, and at such point when the project is developed, the easement would be offered probably at the same time that the deeds for the road would be offered, and that would be up to the town council to accept that easement or not. Well, I mean, just as one voting member of the board, I would feel that I need to know that that provision is in there because otherwise it could be held in perpetuity of maybe this will be farmland. Oh, I do appreciate that having farm equipment and storage for mulch and whatnot is also important, but I, I think there has to be some recognition if, if the agricultural use ceases in the three-year period, makes a lot of sense to me, then the, it would revert into a public access situation of some sort to get credit for that two-acre parcel. I mean, so for example, let's say the Bamfords decide that um, they don't want to be farmers anymore sure. and they sell the property. The easement states that this agricultural easement would not be allowed to be sold separately without creating a vehicular access to it. Let's say the uh, Bamfords didn't create the vehicular access and sold the whole thing and they didn't sell it to a farming family. They sold it to somebody who wasn't farming it. That would be an obvious opportunity for the town to assert its rights that it's no longer being used for agriculture and that it now has a different type of easement. Thank you. Or they could sell it to another farmer. Thank you. Correct? Anyone someone else, else who, who, someone who wanted to continue, correct? Yes, one of the gentlemen that spoke, spoke about the access road and the construction traffic um, and I guess that that hadn't been discussed and I wondered if you were sympathetic to building that first or should it be ordained in this that it comes first, etc., etc. No, uh, Joel has confirmed that that's step one in the development would be to construct the road <coughs> and uh, he's also clear, I don't know if the town requires a typical, uh, you know, some towns require like a construction management plan, a protocol on what's going to happen but I'm quite certain Joel's represented that he would be um, constructing the road. First, he's constructing the road first. Um, second, the um, construction activity would not come through the abutting neighborhood, which is fairly tight, uh, the, uh, the remainder of Astor Lane. He would be coming off of Spurwink and into the site from the new road. Um, that has been my understanding as well, but I'm not remembering there being an actual note on the plan that says that mm -hmm. and therefore I would suggest to the board that a condition of approval that, that requires that would probably be appropriate. I, I know another. Go ahead. Whoever, so, go ahead. Um, I you might want to pull your mic down though. Sorry. <laughs> I thought my voice was loud enough to carry. Um, I, I've heard that they couldn't can be a problem on the existing area around, not on this particular development at the moment, when the children, some congestion when the children go to catch the bus and when they dropped off from the bus. And I'm, I'm wondering, looking at the plan, if there's somewhere that could be designated for the children to get onto the bus without jamming up other people's access to and from the sites. I'll, Henry, I, while I appreciate that and having driven through that neighborhood, I agree how tight it is. That neighborhood is not part of this development. No, I know, but I might And guess. if they're going to be building the road first, and, and we're going to stipulate that the road will be built first, then um, it, it will take the burden off the uh, existing neighborhood. Well, I agree they will take the burden off there, but... The point is, it still is a safety issue um, in terms of children getting onto it if it's part and parcel of the only entrance and ent exits, and I see there's possibly two on that um, at the time, 
during during school loading and school unloading. I mean, maybe the road should be widened a bit, or a little area where the bus can pull off, or something like that. That's my only I, my only uh, comment on it. I'm mean, not insisting on it, but I mean, you know, as a as a good so I think Samaritan, we, I, think. I think what we should say and could say. I don't. I can't commit Joel to building a, a bus uh, location, but he's. I think we're happy to have a discussion with the whoever operates your your school bus routes. Look at what's there. Look at what's in the area, and try to figure out um, a means to help alleviate that. I'm. I don't. I can't speak for Joel whether he has designed space or there's available space in here to have the bus in in the, this project or if this project would be where your school department would want the buses picking kids up well i understand so that. i understand yeah. the concern but we can't we can't that's fair yeah 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 thank you thank you that's fine okay go ahead victoria um a couple of questions um we received this document um that let's see if i can find the title of it might be from the DEP. Mm -hmm. We received the DEP document, and there were a couple of things in this document that I'm not sure um, we've addressed anywhere. So I just looking for a little guidance. I don't know if these need to be a condition of approval or <coughs> cover. Like uh, for example, it says the applicant proposes to submit a payment of twenty-four thousand plus to the town of Elizabeth for uh, the twelve foot watershed. Is that already covered in here that the it, DEP requirements shall be a condition of approval? Shall I? Go ahead. There's no requirement that the planning board make any activity. You, you don't have to do anything with your approval for the <coughs> state requirements to be in effect. Okay. There's nothing. We are going to be accepting that check, though. <laughs> I'm pretty happy about that. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that we... No, it's the site, site location law applies. The applicant has to comply with the state permit. If there were things in the state permit that we really wanted, we might want to make, them, make sure they're on their, our plan. But my sense is that everything we want is already on our plan. Right, just yeah. a couple of items. There was just another one too. But if they need yeah. to comply, they have to. He has to comply with those. Okay. Uh, my other question was, um, uh, we did get some information about um, some proposed plantings, and um, what was it? Oh, two of them are prohibited and should be replaced. I didn't go back through your planting list, but from from uh, the tree warden. From the tree yeah, yes, there. no, I read that, and he seemed quite clear that there were, um, he had different recommendations for, for tree plantings, and I don't think any of those are going to present a problem. I mean, he said some of them will just die, or they're not suitable, or they bring in disease, I think, was one of, one of the comments. Well, he's saying for, two proposed plantings. Yes, so I understand. plantings brought in, and he's saying they are prohibited, so I was yeah. wondering mm -hmm. if we could, and I'm sure you probably won't oppose, a condition saying the yep. tree warden could possibly look at the final planting schedule? Absolutely. If the board's okay with right. that. But I think all of you got the, the tree warden, just so you know, he's a very, very, very part-time employee. He's paid on a stipend and contacted him late last week and gave him a copy of the applicant's yeah. plans. He looked at them over the weekend, came back with I thought was a very thoughtful email on Monday and um, basically said there's two of the proposed tree species that, that are on the no plant list and I would just suggest that those be replaced with tree species that are on the Appendix C of our subdivision ordinance. And the tree warden was fine with that. I believe the applicant didn't have any problem with it. No problem at all. No. Um, should that be a condition be a uh, tree warden will be approve these or just that the applicant will put two other species? I, I would suggest that you actually state that the these two species be replaced with approved species on the Appendix C list because you don't need to defer your authority to the tree warden in that way. If, if you look at the proposed uh, um, motion under conditions, yep. number two and three, both address that. Oh, thank you. It's on page 14. Yes. Thank you very much. I did miss that. 
I did two until I just looked. Okay. Um, just wanted to see if there was anything else. Um, I don't know. Let's see. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Let's I know we did hear a lot tonight about the open space, and so I, I, I always like to uh, let you know I'm hearing it, and I do want to address it, uh, because uh, I also kind of struggled with this whole definition of farmland. So I actually went to our comprehensive plan, and I pulled out the map on the farmland, and I found it very interesting that some of our largest farms, which are in red, are not in prime farmland. And some of our homes are built right over the prime farmland. I, I couldn't find in, in Why Maine. are you surprised by that? <laughs> so, um, I, 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 I was looking for that rhyme and reason. I would have expected prime farmland to be owned by farmers, and it's where our houses are, and your farms are not in prime farmland. Um, so just kind of put that out there that I was surprised, but that is a fact. Um, so the Bamford's farm is also not considered prime farmland. And as far as um, parking equipment, um, having mulch piles, um, just cover your ears, Carol Ann, but it reminds me of somebody's um, mulch business that is an active farmer, that you can have a farm that has a place to put your tractors and put your mulch, and, um, and I consider that a farm. So th there was a lot to it. Um, the town attorney did look at it. The council then weighed in. The council took their vote on it. And, um, and I know not everyone is obviously happy but that is how um, we are now following that new ordinance and um, but I did want to bring that up um, and as far as um, housing bringing in uh, tax dollars I also want to point out because I think this is really important uh, this new ha housing is more than just tax dollars I view it as diversifying our housing base um, there is a demand for this different type of housing. This is not your typical single-family um, subdivision. This is for a different uh, generation that is looking for a different type of housing on just one level. And, um, and I also view this as um, that is also the bonus that is being brought to Cape Elizabeth more than just the tax dollars. Um, and I, and I am really hoping that when um, Joel is done with this project, it, it won't be just walking in people's backyards. We had a long conversation about asking you to make sure this is attractive, that nobody feels that they're walking out in space that they don't belong, that this would be a true walk in an area that is um, the kind of open space that people are expecting more than just backyards. And, um, and I'm, Looking forward to that because we worked hard on that as a board to try to bring that to your attention. You're putting in the stone walls, you're putting in the plantings, and I think when it's all said and done, that it will be attractive. Um, it, it's just one of those things that reminds me of the short road pathway. A lot of people were against that, and then once it was done, people were like, okay, not so bad. And I'm, I'm kind of hoping that it'll fall on those lines. And that's all my comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? All right, does someone, do we want to move to a, mo a motion, or what do we want to do with this? I'll make a motion. Okay. Oh, Michelle, yeah. Go ahead. one technical uh, correction, if we're going to be reading a motion in the conditions, on page 14, number three, it says the trees proposed to be planted between Astor Lane, and is there something left out there between Astor Lane and what can be replaced? Oh, between Astor Lane and the pond. And the pond, okay, great. Sorry about that. Yep. And, and since you brought that up, uh, that that condition is really a good spot or condition to, to insert um, the tree warden's request that those other tree plantings be replaced as well. Good. Okay. Say that again. In either condition two or condition three, actually condition two would probably work better, Condition two says the proposed Canadian hemlock, what I would do is say Canadian hemlock, comma, river birch, comma, and 
other plantings not on Appendix C be replaced with trees allowed on the road tree list? There's Canadian Hemlock River Birch not on the... On Appendix C. Appendix C? Yes. Will be. And what did you say was the rest of that? Will be replaced? Uh, you can go right back to what it already oh, says. Okay. Well, we also be adding something about Astro Lane being constructed. Yeah, I think the first that, that should be added first, as well. First condition mm -hmm. should be the the extension of Astro Lane. Should and I, I think what you want to say is that it be constructed and that access to the new development during construction be from the newly constructed portion of Astro Lane. Are you ready, Joe? I know John actually reads these. All right. <clears throat> Motion for the board to consider. Finding a fact. One, Joel Fitzpatrick doing business as Maxwell Woods LLC is requesting final subdivision review, a resource protection permit, and site plan review of the Maxwell Woods development, including 38 condominiums and eight apartments and two buildings located at 112 through 114 Spurwing Avenue, and amendments to the Spurwing Woods subdivision to accommodate grading changes related to the road extension, Greenbelt Trail, and condominium lighting, which requires review review for compliance with section 16-2-4 major subdivision review, section 19-8-3 resource protection permit regulation, section 19-9 site plan review, and section 16-2-5 amendments to a previously approved subdivision. Two, the subdivision will not result in undue water pollution. The subdivision is not located in the 100-year floodplain. Soils will support the proposed uses. The slope of the land, proximity to streams, and state and local water resource rules and regulations will not be compromised by the project. Three, the subdivision will have a sufficient quantity of, and quality of potable water. Four, the subdivision will not cause soil erosion based on the erosion control plan provided. Five, the subdivision will not cause unreasonable road congestion or unsafe vehicular and pedestrian traffic. The subdivision provides for road network connect connectivity while discouraging through traffic. Roads are laid out to conform to existing topography as much as is feasible. All lots are provided with vehicular access. Roads are designed to meet town standards. Six, the subdivision will provide for adequate sewage disposal. Seven, the subdivision will provide for adequate solid waste disposal. Eight, the subdivision will not have an undue adverse impact on scenic or natural areas, historic sites, significant wildlife habitat, rare natural areas, or public access to the shoreline. Nine, the subdivision is compatible with applicable provisions of the comprehensive plan and town ordinances. Ten, the applicant has demonstrated adequate technical and financial capability to complete the project. 11. The subdivision will not adversely impact surface water quality. 12. The subdivision will not adversely impact the quality or quantity of groundwater. 13. <laughs> the subdivision is not located in a hundred year floodplain. 14. The subdivision is in compliance with the town wetland regulations in the zoning ordinance. 15. The proposed subdivision will provide for adequate stormwater management. 16. The subdivision will not unreasonably increase the phosphorus concentration of Great Pond. 17. The subdivision is not located in more than one municipality. 18. The subdivision is not located on land where liquidation harvesting was conducted. 19. The, subdivi the subdivision does not pro 
The subdivision does provide for access to direct sunlight. 20. The subdivision does provide a vegetative buffer throughout and around the subdivision and screening as needed. 21. The subdivision will comply with the open space impact fee with the preservation of 8.47 acres of open space. 22. The multiplex units will be provided with access to utilities. 23. The subdivision plan will not be phased. 24. The proposed subdivision will not materially obstruct the flow of surface or subsurface waters across or from the alteration area. 25. The proposed subdivision will not impound surface waters or reduce the absorptive capacity of the alteration area so as to cause or increase the flooding of adjacent properties. 26. The proposed subdivision will not increase the flow of surface waters across or the discharge of surface waters from the alteration area so as to threaten injury to the alteration area or to upstream or downstream lands by flooding, draining, erosion, sedimentation, or otherwise. 27. The proposed subdivision will not result in significant damage to spawning grounds or habitat for aquatic life, birds, or other wildlife. 28. The proposed subdivision will not pose problems related to the support of structures. 29. The proposed subdivision will not be detrimental to aquifer recharge or the quantity or quality of groundwater. 30. The proposed subdivision will not dis disturb coastal dunes or contiguous back dune areas. 31. The proposed subdivision will not mean Sorry, the proposed subdivision will maintain or improve ecological or aesthetic values. 32. The proposed wetland alterations are located in the wetland buffer. 33. The proposed subdivision will be accomplished in conformance with the erosion prevention provisions of Environmental Quality Handbook Erosion and Sediment Control published by the Maine Soil and Water Conservation Commission dated March 1986 or subsequent revisions thereof. 34. The proposed subdivision will be accomplished without discharging wastewater from buildings or from other construction into wastewater treatment facilities in violation of 16, uh, I'm sorry, in violation of section 15-1-4 of the sewage ordinance. And 35. The plan for the development uh, reflects the natural capabilities of the, of the site to support development. 36. Access to the development will be on roads with adequate capacity to support the traffic generated by the development. Access into and within the site will be safe. Parking will be provided in accordance with section 1978, off-street parking. 37, the plan does provide for a system of pedestrian ways within the development. 38, the development will uh, not locate, store, discharge materials harmful to surface or groundwaters. 39. The development will provide for adequate disposal of solid waste. 40. The development will not adversely affect the water quality or shoreline of any adjacent water body. 41. The development will provide for adequate exterior lighting without excessive illumination. 42. The development will provide a vegetative buffer throughout and around the site and screening as needed including buffering of Building B with existing woods located on the abutting town open space. 43. The development will not substantially increase noise levels and cause human discomfort. 44. Storage of exterior materials on that site may be visible to the public, uh, will, not, will be screened by fencing or landscaping. 45. The applicant has substantially addressed the standards of the subdivision ordinance section 16-3-1 resource protection regulations section 19-8-3 and the site plan regulations section 19-9. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Joel Fitzpatrick doing business as Maxwell Woods LLC for final subdivision review, a resource protection permit and site plan review of the Maxwell Woods development, including 38 condominiums and eight apartments and two buildings located at 112 through 114 Spurwink Avenue 
and amendments to the Spurwink Wood subdivision related to the road extension, Greenbelt Trail, and condominium lighting be approved, subject to the following conditions. One, the extension of Astor Lane and access to the new portion will be by the extension. Did I get that right? During construction. During construction. Two, that the plans be revised to address the recommendations in the town engineer's letter dated September 13, 2017. Three, the proposed Canadian hemlock, hemlock and river birch uh, not in Appendix C. And other plantings not in Appendix C. And other plantings not in Appendix C be replaced with trees allowed on the road tree list. Oh, Appendix C subdivision ordinance. Four, that the trees proposed to be planted between Astor Lane and the pond and the pond can be replaced with alternative plant materials best suited for the planting location subject to approval of the tree warden. Five, that easements and deeds be provided in a form acceptable to the town attorney and town manager and signed by the applicant. Six, that the parking areas for the multiplex buildings be expanded to provide for eight parking spaces per building. The parking shall be shown on sheet 5 of 41 and reviewed by the town planner and town engineer. Seven, that lighting be installed at the fourplex building entries and that information be provided that the fixtures will not produce lighting in excess of 0.5 foot candles at the property line. Eight, that the plans be revised and submitted to the town planner for review and approved prior to recording the subdivision plat. We have a second? Second. <laughs> Peter? Oh, so. <laughs> Good job. Does Mr. Uh, I'm not. Could I, could I ask uh, Mr. Shalak? Yep. Um, if you could reread uh, condition number one. Okay. Could be a test of my memory that's <laughs> beyond. Yeah, the construction of Astor Lane is already in access. I just want to make sure I understand. The extension of Astor Lane and access to the new portion will be by the uh, during construction, right? Access to the new portion during construction will be by the extension. That is a little, a little confusing. Can you say Well, he's fine. He's fine. Yeah. He's fine. He's fine. He's okay. close enough. Right. And, and I, can, I don't need it written in, but just I, I understand what the access that we're talking about concerns construction. Vehicle, large scale construction vehicles and so forth. I just don't want to get a problem with yep. Hannah's electric comes through the fuel part of the path lane to come and do electrical work because we're going to be building, Joel's going to be building a lot of yep. units there in the pond. Okay. Okay. Great. It, it has to do I with. I don't need anything in the okay. Well, shouldn't we make sure we have the wording how we want yep. it? Okay. Yeah. You've got a suggestion to clarify that? I think you're writing it down right now. Yeah, but I'm. Just, just if we could do a little, little. If somebody's got a way to reword it's that. That's where I miss the lane. I know. Say, we uh, need a lane. Nope. Yep. Yep. <laughs> How about the extension of Astor Lane and access to the construction area? With that. Well, the point we're trying to get to is that Astor Lane will be constructed first yes. and it will be the access point for construct during the construction so why phase don't we of the just project. say one astro so. lane will be constructed prior to will be constructed first, first. first. And, and it will be the access point for construction vehicles do you accept that friendly yes amendment? okay do you accept that friendly amendment Although I didn't sound very friendly when I just said it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Peter accepted it as well. Is that going to be the final one? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.
Okay. So we have motion, we have a second, we have friendly amendment, and uh, we're all good. Maybe, maybe second. Peter. Okay. Right. Any further discussion? <coughs> all those in favor? It's unanimous. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Item number two, uh, our technically number three, 1226 Shore Road, Office Retail Apartment Building Site Plan Amendment. 1226 Shore Road LLC is requesting an amendment to a previously approved site plan to expand the existing building to accommodate office, retail, and eight apartments. Section 19-9, .9, Site Plan Review. Public hearing will be tonight, but before that, we will have a summary. Have the applicant summarize any changes to the project since our last meeting. Carolyn, I believe I uh, recused oh, myself. Last that's time, right. And I'm going to sit out okay. okay. That's all right. We'll miss you. All set, Madam Chair? I'm all set. All right. It's all yours. Good evening to the board. My name is Steve Bushy with uh, Stantec Civil Engineering Consulting Firm. With me tonight is Catherine Detmier, um, here to go over the project here at 1226 Shore Road. We uh, made an initial submission on August 31st and appeared before you folks on September 19th, at which time you accepted our application as complete. Uh, we made a subsequent uh, submission of materials on September 29th, had a uh, site walk on October 3rd. My calendar here is correct and here before you tonight, uh, hopefully uh, for a positive uh, action taken for an approval for our proposed plan at 1226 Shore Road. I've got the slides that we presented. Uh, a few of them have changed. We want to go over those quickly uh, for the benefit of the public uh, so they have an understanding of the project and certainly willing to uh, uh, take any particular questions. The staff write-up has uh, been reviewed on, by us, by the team, and uh, we're happy with the uh, information provided by the planner and the prospective findings and potential conditions of approval. So. Uh, if we can get to that tonight, that would be great, and I'd uh, like to talk about it. The plan before you hear up on the screen is simply a, an overview for the members of the public. We're looking at a 1.3 acre parcel identified as 1226 Shore Road uh, with a former or physician's office located in the existing building here. It was property that the uh, town uh, previously owned and then conveyed uh, a number of years ago. Uh, located here. We may have a discussion as well for the benefit of the board and the public as to the disposition of a, an easement uh, area, reserved area to the town that the town maintained and kept for access from Shore Road to the uh, rear of the town hall here uh, into the parking lot and so forth. And uh, there was information provided us today from the uh, town's uh, legal counsel as to their um, opinion as to that reserved area and, and so forth. And we can talk about that in a little bit. Here is the boundary survey that we uh, did end up providing though showing the boundary that reserved area that I just described located here. Shore Road to the left hand side. The existing building doctor's office here. Uh, a rear ancillary building out back with an existing parking lot 
this is the area out behind town hall for those members of the public now looking at the plan so this is just a, a 20 foot wide access paved access route with a paved sidewalk from shore road into the uh, town property and that is a reserved area that is uh, the town's and the town's responsibility for uh, plowing and so forth the site plan includes redevelopment of the existing building uh, there would be a new parking lot constructed at the rear with containing 26 parking spaces as well as eight garage style spaces here all adhering to a 50 foot setback from the easterly boundary line so it's 50 feet from where I'm pointing out here to the sideline over on the east side this parking lot here would be accessed off of the uh, the dr existing driveway the existing paved parking lot that it, that is there today would be reconfigured uh, to allow for this new porous pavement parking lot uh, I say porous because that's the the intent uh, to handle our stormwater management uh, pieces is to use a porous asphalt product that would allow basically when it rains that water to uh, percolate down through the pavement section as opposed to, to sheet flow off uh, the best example I could point to that would be uh, some of the uh, main mall road surface uh, out in South Portland is made of porous pavement and I know there's a couple of other larger commercial parking lots in the in the vicinity of that area as well that are porous pavement so and they work it seems to work out pretty well the uh, development here, Catherine will talk about more as to the building and the architecture of what's being proposed. It's simply uh, going vertical with some amount of expansion of the building. And I'm pointing out an expansion area here uh, off the rear of this existing building as well as an expansion out in front. And Catherine will talk about that a little bit more. Uh, we have provided on this plan some landscape pieces and I know that there was a little bit of dialogue at the uh, site walk about uh, plantings additional plantings and the uh, applicant is certainly willing to uh, look at providing and has committed to me at least to uh, present to you folks the uh, uh, willingness to provide at least six uh, evergreen plantings uh, just behind the proposed garage space here that might help make up for a few of the trees that will be uh, cut to uh, allow the construction of this garage building here the next plan is just the grading and drainage plan and we have uh, seen a couple of comments from the uh, uh, town's peer review consultant and that is is in regard to some drainage pieces here we have a little bit of a drainage system we're creating a little bit of a low area between the parking lot and the existing uh, rear building here and uh, certainly uh, take the uh, peer review consultants uh, comments uh, and if we have to make any changes here to the final plans as uh, outlined in the conditions of approval we we can do that this is that rear area and the uh, benefit of just showing this image is the area that the peer consultant has talked about is the piece between what would be the proposed parking lot and this is the existing parking lot that will be raised up in grade to have access to the garage so there will be created uh, a space in between this existing building bump out which is the entrance to the rear building. It's about six or seven feet there and we have to provide some drainage and I have provided a little catch basin structure here the consultants asked about cover over the pipe and so forth and uh, those are some minor details I think we can work out easily enough this is a lighting photometric plan just to uh, detail to uh, the board as well as to the public uh, the idea that we're putting in a couple of new lights in the parking lot we'll have some building mounted lights for safety and security but we have had this uh, professionally uh, done so that we can comply with uh, the town's ordinances relative to uh, lighting coverage here are the cut sheets for the lights and here are the buildings that I will let Catherine talk about and I'm just going to go back for a second here the only change that has happened in terms of lighting is that we have added a sign lighting fixture here and when you go back to the photometrics that has been added on the front um, that came up at the last meeting so this is one that's top mounted on the front freestanding side and will down light to it which we were told is preferred um, so that's what we are proposing 
Um, I'm going to walk you through the floor plans. There is an existing building here, so that's what started the shape of this. That basement area is to be used for mechanical and electrical and storage. Um, noted in the light blue here is the two regions that we're adding on, and that was driven by the upper two floors and the residential units, so I'll show you why the building got bigger. Um, to the it, it got to 5,000 square feet, which is the allowable, but when we get to the first floor, this is still the same as last time. I'll just do a quick walk through. The yellow is denoting the major central front entrance off of Shore Road, which accesses a corridor that runs through the center of the building all the way back out to the parking lot. Um, all of the spaces, every use has an entrance or exit off of that corridor. The blue are the two office spaces that we're looking at. We have a larger one here on the right, a smaller on the left, and then a retail component up in the corner. So the larger office and the retail have their own exterior exit. Uh, the smaller office space is only accessed by the corridor. And then finally, the residential is the red and the pink. They can go through the corridor to their own lobby or they have a separate stair off the back. The upper two floors are the same. Each has four two-bedroom units, ranging from 900 to 1,200 square feet with decks off of them. Here you can see we have a corridor running down between the two stairs. We widened the building up here and grew it back here so that we could have enough livable space to make nice units off of that central corridor. So the floor plans are what is driving the parking calculations. Um, I'm going to walk you through them, but I also have a slide after this to try and explain it a little bit better. Building A is the building that we're working on up front. It has the basement with mechanical electrical, so that doesn't feed into the parking, but then the first floor has approximately a little under 3,500 square feet of office. Um, in, in your uh, zoning, it asks for five spaces per thousand, so that would get us to 17 spaces. The retail component is 835 square feet. That calls out for three per thousand plus staff. So that gets you to two and a half plus two staff, so five spaces. The upper floor is the residential because they're two bedrooms. That calls out for 1.75 spaces per each two bedroom. So with eight total, two on, I mean four on the second and four on the third, we get 14 spaces required, um, taking us to a total of 36 required spaces. It was uh, asked that we also look at the retail component in case something goes in that wants seating because the way that uh, you calculate parking based on some places seating is different. Uh, I've dropped in a counter here and seating for 20 people. In the zoning it says you need one space per two employees and one per four seats. So if you had two employees and 20 seats, that would bump you up to a required six spaces. So by changing that, we go from needing 30, sorry, where is it? 36 spaces to 37 spaces. So we've gone up a count. Um, what we have is we have 26 standard spaces. We have eight garage spaces, and those are to go to the residential units. Each gets a garage space, taking us to 34. And we're requesting that we have four shared spaces for the project. Um, that's something that's allowed per your approval. That would mean that somebody who lives upstairs and drives to work during the day would leave their space. Someone who uses the office could then use that to park during the day and they'd swap back and forth. Um, based on the believed uses, uh, we think that there's ample parking as it is, but we would like that request of four. Building B in the back, no changes being made to that building. The use is to be office space. It has a little over 700 on the first floor and then a mezzanine. Most likely the mezzanine will go to storage, but I ran it as office space just to do what would run the highest numbers. So with 1,000 square feet at five per thousand, that requires five spaces. It has room for three standard spaces and it already has two garage spaces, so that would meet the zoning. So I just ran a table here because I know it can be a little bit confusing and I don't mean to go over this too much, but just to clarify, we have building A, so here are the requirements based on level and the uses and the number that ran it. It takes us to 37, so I went with the seating calculation, the one with higher requirements. And then the proposed parking that we show, we have our 26 standard, our eight garage, and our four shared, taking us to 38. And then on building B, it's pretty straightforward. We have the office space and storage office leading us to five required, and we have five total spaces between the garage and the exterior. So I'll try and run through these quickly because you've seen them, but here is our building and the trees sort of denote the interesting part about this site. We're sitting right on the border of a large residential area of Cape Elizabeth and the town center more commercial area. 
So um, both the architecture and the uses that we're proposing feed into this borderline. Um, we have mixed use. We're looking at office, retail, and residential. And what's nice about that is in these older New England towns, a lot of time they're very driven by vehicular traffic downtown. Everybody drives to and from their houses that are further away. But by bringing housing units back downtown, it's starting to stimulate the town again through foot traffic. It brings life to the um, area both night and day and all through the year. And then it also has components that feed back into the residential. And we've got a nice path system here already in place in Shore Road so that anybody using that building could go by foot, bike, or car. When we get into the building elevations, um, I've shown them in color now to try and get it a little bit clearer. The color doesn't show up that well here, but what we have is certain teed uh, cedar impression shingles, and we are differentiating between charcoal gray on the first level and then a cedar on the um, upper two floors. So we're trying to separate that uh, commercial use versus the residential use, and the windows play into that too. With our casements on the first, no divisions. Upstairs we have uh, double hungs with divisions and casements, so we're trying to play off of that and break up the building to scale. And then the roof line required 7 and 12. We've gone to a 9 and 12 pitch, but then overlaid a 3 and 12 shed roof so that we drop in that roof, we bring down the massing by laying in our 9 and 12, and then by popping it up, we get our space back inside, and it creates a cottage feel, which is very much in keeping with Shore Road. Um, I did run our building height requirements. I won't go over that again right now, unless somebody wants me to, I'm happy to. Um, we had this last time, but it might not have gone across. Our sign out front, there's one existing right now. We're wanting to put one in the same location, a freestanding sign, and maybe go up one foot from what's existing. I think we're allowed 14 feet, so we're well within the zoning. Um, and we would keep it within the 20 square feet allowable uh, per side of the sign. We've listed other potential sites for signage, a window sign at the retail entrance possibly, a wall at the common entrance in the back, and then an awning sign on that office space private entrance there. Um, these would all be, everything would have to stay under a total of 75 square feet, but each sign would be tenant based and worked out with the code official as it went through, so I don't have materials for those particular signs. This was just locating the signs on the building. And then there was the garage out back, which has the same material as the residential component, the certainty in the cedar. And it has the pitched roof with the um, gables to break up the length of it. And then we have the articulated doors with lights to try and give it more of a carriage house feel. And then as we walk around the building, um, that wing that was actually already in place based on the footprint, which has the office space on the bottom, gives us a nice buffer between the retail component and the residential that sits on the other side. And then this is another good view of how that roof overlays so that the shed dormer pops up giving you the space, but the steeper pitch really um, brings the roof down. As we circle towards the front, we have the more articulated formal front entrance with the stone half walls and stone wraps around the columns that land. And then I show that in the evening. Um, we have proposed recessed cans for most of the lighting on the building that we, you would see. We want to illuminate volumes of light rather than have decorative lighting all over the building. Um, and then down here, that retail component is able to glow from this view. So when you drop that in, between the plantings that are to be added and the existing vegetation, the building starts to fit into the site very quickly. As we wrap around, you get to a view here where you have the retail component projecting forward. It's a nice place for the retail component. It has that access road directly next to it with its own entrance. Again, dropping it into the site, seeing it with the existing vegetation, but there's still prominence to that corner. And as we get around back, we have that roof line continuing with the sheds popping up. We have that entrance that goes into the corridor and then the um, private entrance for that office space. And then as we back up, we can see the garage in place. What's nice about the building, the main building and the garage, is that the two of them wrap the parking lot. So that's complementary to the residential neighbor. It starts to block the views of the parking from that residence. And now that we're adding more plantings behind that, it makes a nice screen. And then we get into the evening shot, and what you can see here is, again, those volumes of light on the building. And then by adding wall lighting to the garage itself, we're able to cut back on the amount of pole lighting in the um, parking lot. 
Uh, so we have a project that's sensitive this, to this boundary that it sits on between commercial and residential and its architecture uh, ties into both and it creates a sense of scale that doesn't make the transition too abruptly. So we see this as a, an addition of a mixed use project on a site that allows it to be supportive of the smaller New England community. All right, I'm now gonna open this for public hearing. There's anyone who would like to speak on this uh, project. Please come forward, state your name, address, and please limit your comments to three minutes. Paul Seidman, Oakview Drive. I just had a question about the height. Uh, the tallest point from where the building meets the lawn up. Okay. We'll, we'll wait till the end. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak on this project? Seeing no one, I'll close the public hearing and you may answer that question. Thank you. Sorry, I should have just gone through it. Um, it's a little bit hard to read, but what we're allowed is 35 feet, and that 35 feet can be to the mean height of the major um, pitch on the roof. I met with the code officer to go over this. We actually read it slightly differently. I read it that it would be to the middle of the pitch that would go, the major pitch that would go to the top. He read it as whichever pitch has a center of its angle that is the highest one on the entire building. So I've drawn it to both up here. So we take our average grade based on the survey. We go to each corner of the building, we get our average grade, and then we go to the center line of that slope. I thought it would be the major roof line that goes all the way up. He said to take it from the shed dormer because the center of that one's higher. And we're eight inches below 35 feet when we go to there. So we're within the 35, if that makes sense. So. Thank you. Go ahead. I just want to confirm the board. I did speak with the code officer. He's reviewed the height on this, and he's found that it's, it's under the maximum 35-foot limit. Does the, anyone on the board have any questions? Yeah, I had a question for Maureen. You sent out um, an item about the parking spaces in front. Can you elaborate on that a bit? Yes. Um, so I think most of you are aware that in the town center district, which was adopted in 1995, um, parking is not allowed in the front yard setback. So when this application came in, I believe it was a conversion for the doctor from the community center to a doctor's office. There was already paved area in front of the building. And so it, it was allowed to remain. It was approved as two handicapped parking spaces. And there was some sympathy with the idea that patients of the doctor who might not be able to walk that far could take advantage of that. Um, so in reviewing the current proposal, it's taking the paved area and turning it into three paved spaces. And I felt I had to bring it up to you because the reality is that if this was a brand new proposal, there would be no parking there at all. So it seemed like it might be appropriate to leave it as two handicapped spaces, but to, yeah, it's up to the board to decide. It felt like an expansion to me. They're just regular spaces now, we right? We already switched it, and I forgot to mention that. We took them back to 288. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, to that point, so uh, on the site plan, uh, hard to read, but this is the area in question, and yes, it's two ADA spaces. We can keep these as two ADA spaces. And then rather than having the two ADAs that were in this location, those would just uh, be switched then to the three spaces. So there would be no net loss of spaces. We're just ch uh, changing the location of the ADAs, ADA spaces, which would be at this location. Could you tell me where the commercial, on that top building where the commercial section is? You mean uh, the retail? The retail. The retail is up at the corner by those okay, ADAs. So, so, so your handicapped spots are there. It's right opposite. For easy access to the retail. Yeah, and there's a path there that connects to the front entrance to that corridor that can go to everything. So this plan has the change. I forgot to change it in the signage. Would it be better for the retail, whoever, whatever retail it is, to have those spaces not be ADA? Since it's right, you can zip right in. I mean, 
mean, they might, they might prefer that there are plenty of spaces out back. Um, and so if, because of the fact that we're not supposed to have it in the front, if this is something that the planning board would prefer, it, we're not going to argue with. But I'm sure that I they just, don't would prefer three standard. I'm just envisioning myself. I can zip right in and pop right in. It's going to be. No, I, I agree with you. <laughs> I think the point is, Jim, that if this, if these hadn't been handicapped spaces to start with under the old plan, they wouldn't be permitted at all. Right. So leave them as them. handicapped. Okay, that's, that's fine. I just, yeah. I'm looking at some of the, some of the notes in here, um, but I'll let. Any other questions here? You have something, but I want to make sure the plan is Yeah, I, I'm just looking at at some of the information here. It says so. Has the um, has a plan note be yet been added that's consistent with the uh, total parking on site? Do you have your plan? I'm reading some of our our, our motion, so this is one of the things. Have you already done this? Total parking on site shall be tabulated on a plan note and it, that is consistent with what is shown on the plan. So you need. We had on uh, the latest site plan, this area here for the tabulation of the parking. Uh, what this little parking summary, though, does not reflect would be uh, the analysis that. that Catherine just went through with the addition of some seats in that retail space. So we so it does up. still need to be up. Your plan does Correct. still need to be updated. Yeah. That. Okay. All right. Go ahead. I just had two comments. Um, the first one was regarding the the retail um, at the sidewalk. I was the one that said if you're going to have some seats, you should try to get it approved now. And I spoke to the code officer, and we we both agreed that someone moves in, it's a small business, and they start putting in some seats and then they're in violation of their approval because they haven't gotten any approval and small businesses don't like to come back recycling them and so we thought that throwing some seats in there was a good idea um, and at the time I was thinking four seats 20 seats really does feel more like a restaurant than a retail so my suggestion would be to actually approve this as a 20 seat restaurant and under the pyramid of approved uses in the town center, I think restaurant is like category five or six. So anything you approve as a restaurant would automatically be approved as retail. And it, I think it's just gonna be clearer if it gets an approved. What's that do to parking? I mean, It doesn't do anything to parking because she's recalculated the parking for 20 seats. So what we're doing is if they've met the requirements for a restaurant, maybe it would be clearer. I can see someone moving in there and then they have the seats and someone going to the code officer and saying they got approval for retail and they're actually operating a restaurant. You're going to be able to get exhaust ducts and everything else if somebody's got a fryer and uh, power? That's, it's, that's all code enforcement building requirements. Right. It's, it's coming up with the more intensive use, which allows less intensive uses, rather than a less intensive use that would preclude the more intensive use. Well, I clever. It gives more flexibility, that's for it, sure. It does give them more flexibility. And again, I, you know, I, my office is next to the code officer's office, and I'm trying to make sure that plans get approved, that he doesn't come back and say, what, what, we, what, what does this actually mean? It doesn't have the answers for me. You meant, what were you thinking? Yeah. Well, that's well, not the way it comes well, out. But <laughs> the, the other question I had is, uh, there was a slide that you had that had all the signs on it. And is that a new slide? That was on the last presentation. Okay. I added right, so, dimensions to get to 20 Right. Square. So is that in the submission, is that in the materials that were submitted? It, it was on the, yeah, because I it is. one okay. slide. Because like, I would just say, if it isn't, if it could be. Yeah, it, should, it, okay. it was. That's all I have. Oh, Peter. Uh, Maureen, one question. I'm, I think I'm a little confused if you could clarify for us the status now of the buffer area 
on the easterly boundary of the property with the residential zone, there was a discussion about not cutting any more than they had to, and they mentioned putting in, I think, six evergreens in back of the garage, but with respect to the balance of that area, are there any expectations or requirements that we have? Yeah, I, you know, I think I went on at length about that, and it's because it's, it's a painful topic. We, we tried once before to preserve that 50-foot area, and um, our notes were insufficient to allow it to be mostly cleared out. So I really would hate to see that happen again. Um, what I'm suggesting is that the, the applicant was provided a note that the town has used before to protect buffer areas from being cleared, and they've added that note to the plan. But the note talks about a building envelope, and it really should specifically reference the buffer area. So I'm suggesting that there, be, and again, this is the code officer pointing at plans when it's time to enforce, that there be a very clear boundary that defines the buffer area and then that the note that the applicant has been provide, provides us be amended to refer to the buffer area and not to building outflow. And, and the reason I think we need a boundary for the buffer area is because not all of the 50 foot wide strip actually has vegetation <coughs> that have any height. Part of it is lawn. And the, the, intention, the impression I got from the planning board at the workshop is you were okay with that. Do we have a note to that effect? There's, there is, Required. Um, I see you're saying, do I, did I write a condition? Uh, number six it. on page seven. Yes, there it is. Note seven on sheet C2 shall be revised to refer to the buffer area. That's it. And, and it <laughs> shall be delineated and labeled on the plan. Right, but, but with, respect to any substantive activity that should or should not be done in that buffer area, do we have any specifications? Using our standard language, which requires the code enforcement officers, correct? Well, there, there is one wrinkle in that, and I think the wrinkle is that in the area where the garage is, there's, I, I think it was three major trees that were mm -hmm. going to be removed. Right. Mm -hmm. And I would suggest that the the plan be amended to actually label those three trees that are to be removed so that it's clear and they have to go and then everything else has to stay. Okay, well that's point one. And then point two is our, our standard note really says don't mess with the vegetation, you know, don't cut things down. In other words, things you shouldn't do, which is, is also fine. Did we intend to have a requirement of additional plantings be made in that buffer area? To there's, supplement. there's nothing proposed. Mm -hmm. If you do intend it, then you need to identify that. We did talk at the site walk about offering buffering to the neighbor mm -hmm. from the, seeing the back side of a garage. If it, well, and that yeah, has been dealt with. Which is what is right. dealt with. Yeah, the rest of it seemed pretty dense to me. I, I wasn't offended by what was there. But right. Just want to make sure that because the Because they will be taking down some of the trees in order True. to put up the garage. So to keep the buffer as robust as it is today to do some plantings to. So our note, you think note seven is good or do you have some additional lingo that ought to go in there? If you want more plantings, then they should be shown on the plan. No, even without more plantings, is, are I, you I comfortable think, with the way it now reads? I think note, I think condition number six should be augmented to also state that the applicant label the three large trees that are supposed to be removed. And there are three? There's no more than three? Uh, correct. Okay. I don't trust my memory. <laughs> that coupled with the provision of offering uh, to plant six evergreen trees in okay. the back area here, uh, I think addresses the, maybe the comment here just from a moment ago. Yes. Are you going to add those six those evergreens? Those will be added the onto the front of the drawing. Okay. So note six has to also include labeling the three trees to be removed and showing six evergreens, six feet to eight feet at time of planting. Six evergreens that are on Schedule C. 
No, you, you can't <laughs> use you can't use appendix C because that's trees. Oh, but, oh that's trees. Okay. But we can say six evergreens, six feet to eight feet at time of planting. Okay. Is there anything else? Go ahead, Jim. Uh, yes. Page four, number 11. Now, when we had the site walk, we talked about the noise of the heat pumps. And you've got the uh, noise you expect the uh, residential users will generate the loudest noise, 40 dBA at the property line. Is that based on the heat pumps or? Yeah, the uh, heat pump information that the uh, uh, developer here has given me is going to be using Mitsubishi heat pumps. And I looked those up. He gave me the product data on those. Those produce about 49 to 50 uh, dBA. Uh, when they're outside so you know i looked up okay what's that equivalent to right nearly yeah, like at the property line yeah, yeah. It, it, okay. that's standing right next to them uh, i did a google search and youtube and the, the mitsubishi units are extremely quiet they are very quiet yeah. yeah i guess it's more for the record just make sure we do that um and then number 12 right after that looks like you've got the 10 by 12 wood solid waste storage i guess i don't know the dimensions of a dumpster is that room for two dumpsters or one uh, probably a single dumpster with a few uh, totes as well for recyclables. Yeah, I'm just, um, and that's for both buildings, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Well, hopefully, I guess if, if a truck backs in there and has the lift and lifts it up, hopefully they can, nobody's parking right there. Right. Um, I guess I'm just making an observation. Um, might be kind of tight. I don't know. Um, I know why you put it there. It's back in the way back and not unsightly. I guess I have no. I, I just see that as a potential problem if somebody's parking there and the, and the dumpster and the truck shows up. You won't be able to get it out of there. It's a bit of a scheduling piece to know when the uh, solid waste vendor is going to be coming. Yeah. Making sure there's nobody parking there, but a little mm. bit of a logistical issue. I don't know, have you ever had to deal with anything like that before? Just... My experience is that uh, people will show you where the dumpster is going to go, and then after a couple of years, the dumpster ends up in a parking space so that it has adequate access. Yes. <laughs> Is that Sheard's parking place? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think dumpsters share very well. Oh, okay. They had to go to work for the day. All right. That, that's all I have. Anybody else got anything? I have a question um, about building two. One of the things that was asked for were floor plan for building two at one point. I read that somewhere. <laughs> and uh, an assurance that it is going to be the owner is going to um, office space is going to be there because it is not ADA compliant and uh, the, it, the concerns the engineer had about uh, drainage between the two buildings because reserving the right to install a short retaining wall is not usually the way we go we want to know what you're going to do before we approve the plan I, I looked at that area that's located right in here. So first on the assurance on the, the use of it, and I understand there is a potential condition that would require placement of a note on the drawing uh, mm -hmm. in regards to that. And we're willing to do that and would provide that plan uh, for that. So uh, as far as the drainage piece here, looking at the grades, we have about 18 to 24 inches that we have to overcome between the parking lot and that building uh, finished floor area. And so that's in a space of six and a half, seven feet. So it's going to be a roughly a three to one grade to match in between the parking lot, which is just slightly higher than the existing building area here. So uh, I've shown a little bit of a drainage piece. Um, the need for a retaining wall, I don't see that, uh, given that amount of vertical that we have to overcome there. 
uh, how that drains off or how that grades off, if we go a little steeper or not. Um, I, I don't think we need to go much more than that three to one slope to match in. So that probably needs to get this cleaned up a little bit with a couple of the contour lines. There's a, a third, there's a contour line shown on our drawing that doesn't really need to be there because it's matching in with the existing floor grade of the building. So um, understood the comments from the peer reviewer and we can clean up that little area there, but it's not a lot to, to deal with. I didn't, they made a comment as well about the parking spaces coming in there and if there was a drop off, a, a wall might imply that there would be a drop off or something mm -hmm. like that, which we will, wouldn't want to have. But a three to one slope, um, worst I could see might be the need to put in curb stops there or some type of piece, but I'm relatively comfortable with a three to one slope uh, off that edge, but that's not too dramatic. Okay. Just making sure we had a condition in here to address sure. that. <laughs> Anything? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, the times when the parking lot is full, people are going to park in right behind us here. Is that going to, I guess it's after hours, there's plenty of space. Is that going to be a problem? Is anybody going to care? Uh, in, in the high level point Probably of view? Not. No. I, I'll tell you honestly, in my opinion, we've already got a paved parking area and I'd rather we reuse our existing parking areas than add more pavement. Um, this parking lot has already been poor, partially reserved as overflow parking for the vacant lot next door, if that's ever developed. Um, I know that there have been people in the past who have approached the former manager asking for permission to have um, parking here during an event and he's granted it. So. Uh, I'm not really concerned okay. that there's a couple overflow spaces back here. This one's mentioned. Okay. All right. Anything else? Do we want to make a motion or do we want to? Joe, you want to go for two? No, it's okay. <laughs> You're exhausted, huh? I'll make a, a motion for the motion for the board to consider. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of 1226 Show Road LLC for site plan review of a mixed use office slash retail slash eight apartments building expansion located at 1226 Show Road be tabled to the regular November 21st, 2017 meeting of the planning board. Uh, motion for approval, findings of fact. Wait, oh, you, you, you. No, oh, we got to vote on the motion, I guess. Well, you motion, you made the motion to table it instead of the motion to approve it. Oh. Because we had two choices oh, of motions. Approval. I'm sorry. <laughs> Auto no one seconded it. Yeah, let's. Uh, Do we need to and then vote? No, it? let's re I'll, I'll <laughs> rescind. It failed for lack of a second. <laughs> okay, we'll declare it failed for lack yeah, of a second. Uh, that's How's a that? failed motion. Okay, that was just a drill. Now you're going to change the mind. Retail. Okay. Um, motion for approval. Findings of fact. 1226 Shore Road LLC is requesting site plan review of a mixed use office slash retail slash eight apartments building expansion located at 1226 Shore Road, which requires review under section 12 or 19 9 site plan regulations. Two. The plan for the development. Uh, reflects the natural capabilities of the site to support development. Number three, access to, a, to, to the development will be on road, excuse me? Wait, sorry. Okay, sure. help me out here. Well, will be on roads with adequate capacity to support the traffic generated by the development. Access into and within the site will be safe. Parking will be provided in accordance with section 19-7-8 off street parking. The plan uh, does provide for a system of pedestrian ways within the development. The plan does provide for adequate collection and discharge of stormwater. Six, the development will not cause soil erosion based on the erosion plan submitted. Seven, the development will be provided with an adequate quantity and quality of potable water. Eight, the development will provide for adequate sewage disposal. Nine. The development will be provided with access to utilities. 10. The development will 
not locate, store, or discharge materials harmful, harmful to surface or groundwaters. 11. The development will provide for adequate disposal of solid waste. 12. The development will not adversely affect the water quality or shoreline of any adjacent water body. 13. The applicant has demonstrated adequate technical and financial capability to complete the project. 14. The development will provide for adequate exterior lighting without excessive illumination. 15. The development will provide a vegetative buffer throughout and around the site and screening is needed. 16. The development will, substan uh, will not substantially increase noise levels and cause human discomfort. 17. Storage of exterior materials on the site that may be visible to the public will be screened by fencing or landscaping. 18. The application substantially complies with Section 19-9 site plan regulations. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of 1226 Shore Road LLC for site plan review of a mixed-use office, retail, eight apartments building expansion located at 1226 Shore Road be approved, subject to the following conditions. That the plans be revised to satisfy the concerns of the town engineer in his letter dated October 12, 2017. Two, that floor plans be provided for every floor of building number two and the basement of building number one. Three, that the plans be labeled that the office space in building number two shall only be available as personal office space for the owner. Four, that parking for the site be clarified as follows. Uh, no more than two handicapped parking spaces shall be shown in the front parking area. Total parking on the site shall be tabulated on a plan note that is consistent with, with what is shown on the plan. Use of the garage space in building number two shall be made clear. The parking calculation table should be expanded to show all building area by floor use and parking requirement. The application should consider providing for limited seating and required parking for the retail space. Do we want to hear put 20 seats? No. And specifically say that? Well, the applicant is proposing something and you're approving what they're proposing, which is 20 seats, so I would leave that last bullet off. Okay. Five, the road easement should be reviewed for clarity in description, reviewed for clarity in, in, in description of location. If the town attorney determines this, the description is unclear, the applicant and the town should attempt to correct the deed as needed and obtain necessary approvals. Six, note seven on sheet C2, should be revised to refer to the buffer area and the buffer area should be delineated and labeled on the site plan. Seven, the note regarding preservation of the 36 inch oak, oak tree located on the western front of the property should be revised to specify that protection fencing be installed at the drip line of the tree and that tree trimming be done consistent with arbor Arboricultural standards is a $10 word. Eight, that a complete set of plans and materials for the project be submitted to the town planner, which also satisfy the above conditions. Nine, that there be no issuance of a building permit uh, nor alteration. Is that nor, nor alteration of the site until the above conditions have been satisfied and a performance guarantee has been provided to the town. I got a wave and a, a voice, so I, I'll go with the voice. <laughs> All right. What about um, making the retail space a restaurant? Friendly amendment. Okay. I'd like to make a friendly amendment um, that we add uh, the retail space shall be um, approved as a restaurant. Do we have a second, by the way? Yeah, yes. Joe. Said oh, you, and you also. So You're offering the second and an, an amendment, is that right? Yes. Okay. Next slide. So, so that does... Shall be approved for use as a restaurant. You're just going to substitute the word restaurant where the word retail is being used? Okay. 
Okay. Uh, that's an acceptable amendment to me. Yes. yes. <laughs> Go ahead. Acceptable to you? Yes, acceptable to you. I have a question. Go ahead. Did you strike that last yes. thing? Under, under four. Number four? Yep. Did you take that all out? Yep. Which one did you strike? Uh, number four. The, the last. last bullet under number four. On page six. Okay. There's been something put in in its place, right? No, 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 it was put in its place. You offered an amendment. And where is the retail space going to go? The, and the two words where it says retail will be replaced with restaurant. And the two at the beginning where it describes the uh, findings, of findings of facts, number one, where it says office, retail, eight apartments, it's okay. going to be office, restaurant. And in on page six, yeah. um, Therefore, be it ordered where it says office yeah. retail, we're going to say office restaurant. Okay. 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 That works. And I have a friendly amendment to, to note number six on page seven, where it talks about note seven on yeah. sheet C2 to add a sentence that says, um, well, how do I want to word it? Add to the plan labeling of the three trees to be removed and show six evergreens, six to eight feet at time of planting uh, to be planted behind the garage to show their planting. That's acceptable. How about you, Joe? Is that acceptable? Yes, that's acceptable. All right. Carol, can you just tell me again how the restaurant seating issue is being handled other than a reference to a restaurant? It, that has not been handled. The should seating, be, the be. seating. The word restaurant with retail was substituted. R right. right. But and we the use, actual seating has not been handled. It should be. So. Mm -hmm. the, the applicant has a revised parking table. Yep. And I would say that that revised table is going to end up on the revised plans. So he can show in his table a 20 seat restaurant. And, 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 and they sh the part on the plans where it says retail will be replaced with restaurant. And we shouldn't sign it until we make sure that the table is on there. You don't have to sign site plans, but because I have to review the final plans, that's what I would do. Okay. And it will say restaurant, 20 seats, X parking spaces. That's what I would do, yes. Okay. So, so we're good. We're good. Okay. All right. Anything else? All those in favor? Opposed? No one? It's unanimous. Five. Zero. All right. Got it? We keep losing people. Yeah. <laughs> thank right. you very much. Thank you. Board. All right. How far behind schedule are we?
We lost Joe. We're gonna wait for Joe. Okay. Okay. I don't need you to give us some energy. Any projects tonight? No. <laughs> okay, we'll begin as soon as Joe gets back. Next item on the agenda, 75 Ocean House Road, Private Road, Private Access Way, KTO LLC is requesting review of a proposed private road and private access way to create frontage for a new lot to be located to, to be located to the rear of 75 Ocean House Road, section 19-7-9 private road and private access way. And we will be looking at completeness of the package tonight. And uh, take it away. Good evening, Madam Chair and board members. My name is Peter Beagle. I'm with Land Design Solutions. And I'm here tonight with the owner of the parcel, uh, Kevin O'Donovan, a uh, Cape Elizabeth resident and uh, owner of the property. Uh, the property we're talking about, 75 Ocean House Road, which is right here. Uh, so we've got Ocean House Road 77 right here, Spurwink Road, the intersection right here. This is the Canterbury development. We have the golf course right down here. And the other buildings surrounding us are uh, residential uh, properties. The right of way we'll be talking about is this uh, little dash strip right here, 35 feet which is owned by the uh, adjacent property, uh, owned by the uh, Clarks. Uh, Kevin purchased the uh, property in uh, 2017 and has since uh, renovated the existing family residence. When he purchased the uh, parcel, the deed specifically stated that the property was made up of uh, two separate lots with each of the two lots being granted a right of way in common with the others over 35, the 35 foot access way. And as I said, the access way is on the Clark's property. But the, I think the point um, here is that the, uh, the deed stated there was access for uh, two lots. Now whether, we, we know it all depends on the town zoning, whether there actually are two lots or not. But the, I think the point um, of having two access ways is uh, import, important. Um, I'm going to move on to the next plan, which was the boundary uh, survey. The existing conditions of the site, we're in the residential C, RC zone. The parcel is approximately uh, 2.02 uh, acres. Three quarters of the parcel is uh, wooded. You can see the wood line right here. This is the existing house, which Kevin has since uh, renovated. This is the uh, adjacent uh, Clark House and Clark's uh, garage. This dashed line right here makes up the 35 foot wide uh, right of way. Um, again, we have the, the golf course here. We have residential property here. Um, we have a wetland line here and here. So this is a wetland area in between. Route 77 out here is classified as an arterial uh, ro road by the town of Cape Elizabeth. Um, being an arterial road, you need sight distance of uh, 200 feet in both directions, and that would be, this is the existing uh, shared drive. I actually, I should have mentioned that before. This shared drive here uh, serves the Clark parcel and the 75 uh, uh, Kevin's parcel. And that has uh, been in existence, um, currently serves the parcels. 
The wetland area that I was talking about is a, a little over 28,000 square feet. It's forested, primarily related to drainage moving across the site, site from south to north. Um, there's a, uh, there's a uh, very poorly drained soil, and we'll see that on our, uh, the next plan, which is in the middle of this uh, wetland, uh, which is a peachum soil. There's a very large specimen beech tree in the corner of this lot. It's right on the, it's partially in the lot, partially in the right of way. Very nice uh, European beech. Uh, Kevin has uh, contacted the tree warden who took a look at it and said um, it appears to be in good health. Um, and we'll be doing everything we can to, uh, if we're uh, approved or in construction to minimize any impacts uh, to the tree. There's a sewer line which runs in the, in the shoulder in front of our property. Um, it's an eight inch uh, sewer line. Uh, according to the public works uh, director, it has capacity and it's in uh, decent shape. The existing house is uh, currently is uh, connected to that. There's also an eight inch uh, ductile, iron, ductile iron water line in uh, Route 77. The existing house is uh, currently uh, tied into that service. We're in uh, floodplain uh, C zone, which is an area of uh, minimal flooding. The shared driveway, um, we uh, retain the services of SW Coal Engineering to uh, uh, dig some, uh, drill some test holes and look at the soils and the pavement um, to determine uh, its quality, um, which uh, they did. Um, move on to our next plan. And this is our plan of private access way and private road. Um, so what, what we are proposing is we're proposing to utilize the town's uh, private access way uh, zoning provision to split off a parcel from this uh, larger parcel. This uh, magenta line you see here would be the division line. So you would have the front lot with the existing house right here. And you would have this back parcel right here as the second lot. We would have the, the yellow uh, color here signifies the um, existing drive that we would be uh, totally rebuilding based on the SW coal work to uh, a private road, uh, which would be 18 feet wide, uh, 18 foot wide paved travel way, and built to the standards of uh, the town's private road standards with uh, uh, the gravel, ba uh, gravel sub base and gravel base um, asphalt meeting uh, those uh, standards. This uh, color right here would be uh, what we're proposing as a private access way. I think when we uh, let, were here uh, talking with you folks uh, during our, our sketch plan presentation, we had talked about um, having a 14 foot wide travel way with uh, two foot grass sol sol uh, shoulders. Um, receiving comments from the fire, uh, fire department and town staff um, seemed that it would be better to just maintain the 18 foot wide uh, width on the travel way the whole, uh, the whole distance. And that's what we are uh, currently proposing. We're uh, proposing a uh, hammerhead at the end, which meets the, uh, uh, the town hammerhead standards. Um, when, we were, when we left the, uh, the sketch plan meeting, we um, had uh, uh, one big issue. I'm, a little out of order here, but please bear with me. Our uh, major issue uh, was, did we have the right to use, did this access way go the full length of the property? And we uh, took that back. We uh, met with our attorney. He looked into the deeds, and his opinion was that, yes, we did have the right to, uh, to do that. And we submitted that opinion uh, to the town. I understand the town's attorney has reviewed that and he concurred with our attorney. So that was um, 
that was a, a threshold uh, issue for us. Um, after that, we um, prepared an application for uh, planning board submission, and we had hoped to be here at your last meeting. But a little bit before the meeting, uh, the question arose, um, did our very poorly drained soils, which are in the middle of this parcel, um, did they run off the parcel, and was there a, a, a did that the amount of uh, contiguous, very poorly drained soil equal 43,560 square feet? Um, if it did, that would have kicked us into an RP1 zone uh, with uh, a whole different setback and uh, a, a whole another issue. I'm going to uh, this. So we, um, so we. Uh, tabled our application so we could get that work done, and that's why we're here uh, here tonight. Uh, but this, so this uh, darker brown line is the peach and soil, and you can see where we uh, we did get permission from the uh, adjacent landowners to uh, follow that soil, and here it is. And that um, it did not equal. Uh, we did not meet the threshold. It equals 19,157 square feet, approximately. So that was uh, uh, allowed us to come back to you uh, tonight. Um, so we talked about the, the road. We have submitted a uh, road maintenance plan prepared by our attorney, uh, submitted with our uh, information um, that uh, is being reviewed by the town attorney. Uh, we're glad to make any changes uh, necessary to that. That seemed fairly um, straightforward. Um, the applicant proposed the name uh, Bella's Way after his daughter. The name was approved by the police chief. Uh, that being said, we have uh, seen uh, correspondence uh, with town staff that our um, abutter and the owner of the uh, right of way land, uh, the Clarks, would like to uh, name that uh, Edgecombe Road after uh, some folks that previously lived uh, at that um, property. Um, we're fine with that as long as the uh, name meets the uh, police chief muster. So we have no problem with that. The uh, stormwater on the road we have talked about with the town's uh, uh, peer review uh, engineer. We maintain the existing grades in the front private access way. Um, and then we grade this, the back, the, the new construction, so that the water flows uh, t to our property. The, the access way is, uh, call it, super elevated. So it's, uh, instead of being like a crowned road, um, it's super elevated to bring the water um, towards our site. Um, so we are not um, impacting the uh, adjacent property with any of the uh, new uh, stormwater runoff. Um, the utilities, we originally, uh, on first set of plans that we submitted, we had utilities coming from uh, this area running cross country, across this lot and into our lot, thinking that would be shorter and more economical for us. Uh, we had comments from uh, town staff about relocating utilities into the uh, right of way up here, which we now show on this uh, plan. Um, we talked with the uh, public works superintendent about the uh, sewer connection, and he seems to be fine with what we are uh, showing. He had a comment about uh, on our detail about showing a couple flow arrows, which we um, will add. Um, other than that, he was uh, fine. We talked with the Portland Water District and got there. We submitted our um, a, a presumed fixture count for the house and. And they got back to us with pressure and recommendation of uh, size of line for our um, for this proposed uh, lot. Um, we uh, met with CMP, and that meeting just took place uh, this morning. And CMP um, said that they recommended that we actually move our power from where we were proposing it, coming off this pole, back down to this pole. Um, they said 
to run the power from this top pole, uh, we would need to upgrade the two poles up there. Upgrade as in replace, that the poles are not that high. And if you were bringing power in there to serve uh, our parcel and potentially a parcel on the Clark side, that you would need a, uh, that would be a primary line. Um, so it would require replacement of two poles and a very expensive cable. And their recommendation was um, that we should bring a service line from this pole down through here. Um, so you're only talking about a three foot wide trench and it's a service line so it's not so deep. And they would recommend should this pot, should a lot ever be developed on this parcel that the same could happen from that pole. So you would be replacing no poles, you would just have a service line and it would be much uh, more uh, economical. Um, our sewer line, which we show coming into this uh, property, would be a uh, force main. The elevation is uh, such that we do not have gravity feed out to the uh, main in the street. Um, for our project, we need to require a, a two inch diameter force main. Uh, we, uh, should another lot be served, um, the, the size of that would be uh, uh, upsized to a three inch, uh, three inch force main. And it would be, you would cap a stub right in there. Uh, the, uh, the water line, which we show coming through here, is a, uh, we have a w one inch tap in the street. We run it to a uh, valve, a corporation valve at the property line. And then we run a two inch line into our site. Uh, talking to Portland Water District um, for two lots, they would not allow you to put a, a water main in. They would require each uh, parcel here and a parcel here to have it uh, an individual uh, service line. Um, uh, so that um, so that's not quite as easy as just stubbing a line. You're talking a whole new, uh, a whole. So you have to go back and tear the road up if they ever want to well, do it again. Well, their suggestion was they said you actually, had, they like to deal with um, projects that, that are happening and not um, uh, spe speculative. Um, but what they told me they, from looking at the plan, they said we're not, we don't know why you couldn't put a uh, line down the right side of that, not, not under the pavement, but come back without disturbing any of the pavement that goes in and put the line in over on that side. Mm -hmm. um, so you say you, you said you run a two inch line, but on the plan here, it shows it. Please let him finish his presentation and then we will have discussion. Yeah, uh, right. I've gone back and forth a couple of, a uh, couple times with that. Um, that was their recommendation because uh, uh, given the distance and the pressures, um, so we've got the, the one inch then moving to a two inch. Um, we show um, a building window here and we, we show a uh, no disturb area um, which is this hatched area. Uh, now the no disturbed area, I can't read verbatim the uh, words on the, the plan here, but there are some um, exceptions to that. Uh, utilities, um, dead disease limbs, if you are gonna disturb something, you need to uh, talk with the uh, code enforcement officer. Um, and we, sh we also show that on this plan and unfortunately the color doesn't show up very much but that that slight green color is labeled we're 15 feet off the wetland here and we are uh, 25 feet both sides of this um, of the property line that divides the two parcels and then we're um, I think that's 20 20 feet I believe off the um, 
the right of way. Um, so we're we are proposing that to um, uh, as our building uh, building window. We are asking for uh, requesting three waivers. The first waiver would be to the reduction of the private road right of way from 50 feet to 35 feet. Uh, that's based on our, uh, the right of way that we have is only 35 feet. We're asking for a private road uh, paved travel way reduction from 22 feet to 18 feet. Uh, that's based on our existing field conditions and other similar uh, projects. Our, uh, you know, like I said, we have the, uh, the beech tree, what's here. We have existing um, landscape and lawn and trying to do as minimum, a uh, uh, limited amount of disturbance as we can and still have a safe, um, safe shared drive. Uh, the fire chief, as I said before, has said he is okay with the 18-foot uh, width, that that serves his, his purposes as well. Um, and the last waiver we're asking for is a driveway intersection separation reduction from 125 feet to 116 feet based on the location of our existing shared drive and the existing Canterbury development, which is on the op up here on the opposite side. Um, we believe that with our uh, site distance, which we have, it's in excess of 500 feet going in both directions, and the 35 mile an hour speed limit, that that slight reduction in uh, separation does not uh, create a safety problem. Uh, we had um, a number of uh, points in uh, staff comments for a discussion. Um, First one was the very poorly drained soils, uh, which I already mentioned that we um, had not mapped those off site and we have since gone back and mapped those. So as I said before, we, uh, we are in, still into the, uh, the threshold of a uh, RP2 zone. Um, the other point was the name of the uh, private road access way, which we're happy to change to Edgecombe Road, uh, providing it meets uh, the town emergency criteria. Um, the road maintenance agreement, which we believe we're in pretty good shape with, but we're amenable to any suggestions a town, uh, town attorney has. Um, addressing future uh, development. As I said, the, the, the force main stub is um, you know, a little more money, but not a big deal. The, um, the power, we would really like to take our power from this pole and leave future power, um, should a lot ever be developed here for the future person, whoever develops that. Um, the water, um, we'd like to make sure that space is provided over there, um, but we would like to uh, provide power to our lot and make sure that there's space provided on outside the pavement for uh, future uh, water, should that need ever arise. And the uh, last uh, discussion item was the wetland buffer. Um, and the was a question in town staff comments about uh, potentially providing uh, boulders along the uh, wetland edge to make sure people know where that is. Um, and I guess that's a discussion point. I mean, um, we'd rather not, if it was just up to us, we'd rather show the, what we need to show on the plan um, than have, you know, your nice backyard and you have um, the boulders along the edge. But if the uh, board would like us to do that, that is uh, something we could do. Thank you. Thank you. So our topic right now is completeness. So is there anyone in the audience who would like to comment on completeness? Do we have enough information here to make a decision or to move forward with this project? If you do, please come to the podium and state your name and address and uh, limit your comments to three minutes, please. 
Good evening. My name is Jonathan Clark. Uh, my wife Patty and I have lived at uh, 73 Ocean House Road, the abutting property, for some 42 years. And uh, in keeping my comments limited to completeness, I guess the only thing uh, I can suggest is that uh, I wonder if, if you have taken a site walk down in the back of the property to, to see the wetlands there. Um, when the question came up of the Peachum soils and their extent uh, and the, the second wetlands uh, soil engineer came in to look around, uh, my wife went out and talked with him when he was only there for perhaps an hour. She asked him if he had discovered any Peachum soil on our land back, uh, which is adjacent to Kevin's and, and flows down on, towards Trout Brook and so forth. And uh, he said he hadn't taken any soil samples and could just look at the uh, soil and land topography and he determined that it was fine. I'm, I'm not sure if the board is you know, willing to accept that as science. Um, I wouldn't, but it's not up to me, I guess. And the uh, areas of wetland that are on the Perpudic lands farther to the south are considerably greater than uh, than those in Kevin's land or in ours. And uh, I just wonder to the completeness of the, uh, the investigation into those wetland soils. Um, other than that, we appreciate uh, Kevin's uh, and Peter's willingness to entertain our uh, requests for the name on the road that's being built on our land that we've paid taxes on for 42 years. Uh, because we stand to lose a good chunk of that land to this development, some 4,700 square feet or more, uh, which in fact uh, is equivalent to about 45% of our existing backyard. Um, so it's, it's a major impact to us. Um, but uh, I would think that if, if the, this progress uh, project has to move forward and it's the way it's laid out. Uh, lawyers have determined that that's what's going to happen. We don't really have the resources to fight anything like that. Uh, the only request we might make is if uh, the private access way be uh, built to the standards of a private roadway uh, simply to ease the possibility of future development, something that we had never even considered before this whole plan was developed. So uh, I guess that's our request. I, uh, if, if there's a possibility that we could develop a piece of land as well, or when we decide to move out, if it's a part of the property that could be sold and increase its value, then that's some light at the end of the tunnel for us. But uh, I appreciate uh, that, and I would urge the board to take a, a site tour, take a walk down in the, in the wetlands there, and bring your hip boots and, uh, and uh, look further into this wetland area because it's, it's always been quite extensive. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Craig Ashman. I recently just purchased the property at 10 Perputic Drive. Um, I just kind of got wind of it. This is about a month ago I acquired the property um, and we're renting back to the current owners right now. I own a property on Shore Road. Um, and I, my only concern is just this wetlands as well. And um, I spoke with Maureen a little bit the other day and kind of got my, my head around this because I'm involved with selling my property and moving on to another one, so things are kind of complicated. Um, and just kind of figuring out in this wetlands sort of runs behind our, our property line and then kind of wraps around. There's a culvert underneath our road. I just want to make sure that there's no impact to the flowing water, you know, or, you know, creating any issues there. And then also that they, this building envelope um, has, you know, proper boundaries with, you know, maybe we propose, you know, uh, mandated physical stones or rock barrier so that, you know, once the development along, I guess, with silk fencing or whatever else is required, doesn't get destroyed and impact that uh, wetland back there. Um, that's it. Thank you. Thanks. Excuse me, can you tell me? Your name again? Yes, it's uh, Craig, C-R-A-I-G, last name Ashman, A-S-H-M-A-N. 
A S H M A N. Ash Man. Thank you. Thanks. Is there anyone else? <coughs> Seeing no one, I'm going to close the public comment period. All right. Open to the board on completeness. First, I'd like to assure the gentleman we will be doing a site walk. Do we have an engineering report on your soil uh, examination for the Peachum? Um, you have, I think you have a soil report on the first. Well, where was it led you to not appear at the last meeting because you wanted to investigate this, this piece of uh, the land that had the Peachum soil? Do you have a, a report from that? So, in the application that we submitted, there were uh, soil borings. There was a, a it was uh, Mark Hampton. This would be a uh, section uh, tab three, and it talks about the um, talks about the soils, the soil profile, hydrology group. And there are the test pits that he did uh, on our on our property, and there are the uh, soil profile classification information charts that uh, go with that. Okay, I, I didn't bring the chart. Yeah, I, uh, I didn't bring. It. This is the report for the most recent examination. Is that correct? Uh, I'm really responding to the comment that one of the abutters made that they thought there was kind of a cursory. Uh, look the second time around. So we provided this uh, soils report based on the test pits that Mark Hampton did on our parcel. Then we asked Mark to go back out and follow the Peachum soils in this direction and this direction, which he did. And he provided me with a diagram showing where those soil boundaries uh, were. Um, he did not provide me with any other test pits from those soils. Um, he, as far as I know, he went out and he did whatever he needed to do to the soil to come up with the boundary line of where that went down here and up here. I could go back to him and ask him for um, whatever information he found, um, but I think you will find the, the Peachum soil profiles in, uh, in the, that tab, uh, tab three. Yeah. Go ahead, Maureen. Just to assist, um, in last month's monumental package, right. you received this. Yes. And yes. in tab three is the report, and, and the original report um, talks about soil profiles, and there were hand augured samples, and uh, that information was provided here. Um, the going out the second time to map the Peachum soils beyond the boundaries of the applicant's property is only covered by um, the second page of the applicant's submission for this month. So I think your question was, do we have additional auger information for the additional mapping? And I don't believe that has been submitted. Well, as I understood it, they had this problem that if the extent was great enough, this might become an RP1. And Yes. Cause some problems, and that's a rather major hurdle that had to be crossed. And I'm just wondering, do we have anything documenting that fact? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, well, on the plan that we submitted, you have so this, this Peachum soil line used to come down just to our border, right. our property line, and now, as you can see, it goes down into the golf course property, and it goes up into uh, this property. So the Mark Hampton, the soil scientist, was the one that went out there and, as I said, did whatever he needs to do to the soils to determine where that line goes. And he provided me with the sketch of those, the continuation of that line, of those very poorly drained soils. But do you have anything written from him indicating the work done to ex extend that field of peach and soil to, in, in both directions? Um, I have I have his sketch. That's so, 
Okay, I can I can submit that uh, separately. I, his sketch has been transposed onto this plan, but I can submit that sketch uh, independently if that would be. Well, if it was, it sounds like it was a rather huge issue. And I, I guess I would like to see something a little bit more concrete to indicate that the extent of the Peachum bed was what you show here versus something bigger that would have kicked you into RP line. Okay. Okay, go ahead, Victoria. Um, to follow up on that. Um, could he please submit a Class A high-intensity soil survey map and narrative? That's a yes? Um, yes, if that's uh, uh, what you're requiring, we will we'll do that. Well, as a soil scientist, um, that is his job. He should be sent, uh, submitting to planning boards the Class A high-intensity soil survey map and narrative. It's a minimum requirement because that's it's his job. That's what we would request, not him to just go out and gaze across and then sketch it. I mean, he needs to do the pits, the, the testing. He needs to do a class A high intensity soil survey. Okay. I think he, he thought he, that he did enough test pits to determine where those lines were and identify those soils. I guess he didn't, I did not ask him and he didn't realize that he actually, the class A means you have to do X number of pits in X number of square feet um, to determine that. And so uh, we did not give him that direction. I guess I wasn't clear that that was, that he needed the class A to uh, determine those lines. Um, and Maureen, from your experience, am I asking for too much? Or is this what we expect from a soil scientist? We, we haven't always required a high intensity soil survey. Sometimes we go with medium, but I, I, we usually get more than a sketch. And I guess, you know, the, the original submission, he talks about having done hand augering, and it doesn't appear that the additional mapping was at the same level as the original mapping. Uh, so, which and I can't talk to that. I'll have to ask okay. Mark. I assume that he did whatever right. so, testing and augering he normally does. So I, I can't will have tell to tell you if the original mapping was high intensity, but I can tell you that the original mapping was seems to be much better documented than the <coughs> additional mapping. So to answer your question, you can require high intensity soils, right? That's certainly within your purview. Sometimes my guess is you've accepted less than that. You've got to feel confident that what you've got is an accurate representation. Go ahead, can the board comment then? So how close are we to the threshold that this would go from RP2 to RP1? Halfway? Yeah. We're at 19,000 or something? We have to, so if we're halfway, we have to find a lot more peach in the soil. The, the concern is, and, and I know I'm sounding picky about this, but it's Cape Elizabeth and it's wetlands that the original request from staff was to map all contiguous, very poorly drained soils. And to be specific, what we got was the contiguous peachum soils. So what we need is really, I don't know, are there anything adjacent to the peachum soils that are also considered very poorly drained? I just, I don't know because that wasn't provided, but yes. Right now, what you have is, is an assertion that there's less than 20,000 square feet of Peachum very poorly drained soil. Uh, just, uh, I guess for clarification, I did go back to Mark after uh, oh, we saw your comment and I asked him, uh, not just talking about Peachum soils, but any very poorly drained soils, um, because that's what we need to map. And he said that he had mapped the very poorly drained soils. So that should all be whatever is contiguous is included in our So the only boundary. poorly drained soil he found was Peachum? Yes. And he mapped that? Yes. So, yeah. So now it would have to be off by 50%. Okay. Anything else? Go ahead, Peter. Well, how do we leave this? Do you want to insist on the high, the category you refer to? I, I, I would like to at least see a representation from them that they apply the same amount of due diligence on the, the extended search as they did on the initial. And I assume that the Brayton and Lyman Thurbridge are not poorly drained. Is that the? I didn't catch what you just said at 
Well, it's yeah. between the only poorly drained that we have here. The, the that's what we've just been uh, given. Right. Understand. That's very poorly drained. Yeah, the Brayton and the Lyman Turn Bridge are. Bray Brayton is a poorly drained soil that's an automatic RP2 soil. So okay. the, just, the critical soil is the peachum and anything else that was very poorly drained. And we have an assertion that there's no other very poorly drained that's contiguous to the peachum. Uh, I, uh, Victoria, you, you, have, you, you asked for something. I would be happy with. A representation of the soils engineer that on the extent of his further exploration that he applied the same measure of you know investigation to determine the, the, the layout of the peach and bed. Is that acceptable to you? Or I you think thought we should I heard that the first survey was a class A high intensity. It was not no. the very first one was not. No. Why was the first one not? Uh, well, I guess I don't know why um, that's a lot more intensive and it's a lot more expensive. So if you're just determining um, the soil boundary um, for soil's sake, you're not talking stormwater, you're not talking uh, uh, sanitary sewer fields, then I guess our thought would be why, you know, why would you? I mean, we would like to be as accurate as we can with that line, but that's... Um, a standard reasonable I guess professional practice to do the number of test fits that he did throughout there to come up with that line. Okay. Um, then uh, the same practice then? I mean more th it sounds like we need to bring it up a level that and I'm very concerned I'm hearing people say how wet it is behind and how wet it is off to the north and and I, I'm just not seeing that when I look at this sketch so there's a little concern there about yeah. the accuracy, and, and I don't wish to question the soil scientists, but on the other hand, um, I'm not hearing uh, any narrative other than he went back out, and we're not quite sure what he did at that point to create this. So if we could, we don't have to do the high intensity, but something higher than what he has done and, and, and return with at least the information that is in Appendix 3. Okay. That's okay with the rest of the board. Just more, clar just clarification of what he found. Maybe just state it better. Okay. Any other concern before we take action on completeness? Is reducing that right of way mooring to 35 feet, is that something we frequently do? Um, Yes. When you have an existing situation, you've done that. And I just want to be clear that that's not a waiver that you have to include in your completeness motion. No. That's part of your later motion. Oh. Anything else? Do we want to make a motion on completeness? Go ahead, Peter. Oops. Uh, motion for the board to consider uh, motion for completeness be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented the application of KTO LLC Kevin O'Donovan for review to construct a private road and private access way to be named Bella's way and that changes now to Edge Edgecombe Street Edgecombe Road Edgecombe Road Edgecombe Road to be named uh, Edgecombe Road to provide access to a new lot located at the rear of 75 Ocean House Road be deemed complete. Second. Second. Do seconds. Any other discussion on this? Just so people know, just because we've deemed the package complete doesn't mean there won't be changes to the final product. It, this just means we've got a good base to start with and, uh, and we'll be making tweaks as we go through the next steps. So, um, okay. You know what? All right. All those in favor? So, it's deemed unanimous. All right. Okay. Would you like one in the tabling to Sure. Uh, do? Uh, I do you want to do, go ahead? Is this, uh, now that we've deemed it complete, is there any um, point here that I could just offer suggestions or things that I've noticed on the plan or have questions about, or should that all wait till the public can? Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, why don't we save the public hearing motion for after, yeah. after we go through. Yeah, yeah, why don't you go through those? Okay, thank I you. also want to set a site walk. Definitely. And then the motion for public hearing we'll do last. Okay. okay. I'm, a few questions that I had. Um, I'm looking at, um, oh, I don't see a sheet number. I'm looking at the bounded survey. Okay. Uh, I'm just a, a, a little um, concerned about survey note number six, where it says the wetland lines shown provided by um, Mark Hampton and Associate is not responsible for any errors or omissions. Uh, right. So uh, Dale Brewer, statewide surveys, who did the um, who did the boundary survey, mm -hmm. got the information from Mark Hampton. He's basically saying he doesn't want to be responsible for Mark Hampton's work. Oh. The way she read it, it didn't sound like that. <laughs> right, because that's work that Dale uh, did not do. Oh, I understand, I understand right. what you're saying, but when she read that, it didn't. Yeah, I just, uh, it, okay, I just don't feel great with a notice. That's pretty standard, Is you know, it? engineers, yeah, it's mm. pretty standard. No one wants to accept responsibility for someone else's. Yeah, the, 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 sort of the soil scientist kind of has to submit his own plan because somebody from your team has to be responsible for the information. Uh, right, and and I think on the L1 site plan, yeah, um, which is uh, my plan, I've taken on some of that responsibility and show that their work. I give them credit for it, but I don't actually have a disclaimer on it. Okay, yeah, I don't, I don't like a disclaimer on the soil scientist's work. Um, so uh, when I always look at the uh, plat that's going to end up going to the, kind of the Registry of Deeds, I kind of like those plats to have everything that you would really want, because only one of these pages is going to go, and only one is really where the um, code enforcement officer is going to. He doesn't want to search. We've heard him say, right. I don't want to go through the books. I don't want to go searching. Yeah. And um, I was just wondering if you could add to this one, have I? It's right before L1. If this one's not labeled either. Uh, right. Well, it's because that the recording plan, lots of times it will be subdivision plan. It doesn't normally have like a C1 or an L1. So I, the plan that would be recorded that you're looking at is called the plan of... Okay. Um, public road and uh, or private road and private access way. So that's the one I'm looking at. So that, right. So that's the one we were planning on recording. Yes, I saw the uh, signing block. So I okay. this is the one you yeah. plan on recording. And I was wondering if you could put onto that. There are some um, move the plan reference the survey notes to this plan. You have them on another plan, but I think yeah. they. Uh, Plan references and survey notes actually belong on this. Um, any certification, um, so you'll be certifying both um, the surveyor and your soil scientist will both be certifying this map. Uh, the the surveyor would be certifying that. The soil scientist uh, would not be. Oh, I thought they did. I got that wrong. So we, we usually don't get certifications from soils okay. people for wetland mapping. Okay. Well, actually, sometimes we do, sometimes yeah, we sometimes don't. We it's do. you, yeah. I mean, well, wetland mapping, they actually don't have a seal for wetland delineation. No. Huh? But, but they do for soils. But they mapping. do for soils. <laughs> okay. Uh, so are you saying you want certification for the soils mapping? Yeah, why don't we get for the soil mapping? They're, they're looking at the soils, right? So can he uh, seal like his letter or what he gives you versus putting that on uh, the plan? Oh, we defer to Maureen. What's the best way to handle that? I just want something that's sort of Well, the, 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 the challenge is we want a good quality plan. And we yeah. want a good quality plan with all the good quality information that various different professionals have provided. But they don't want to stamp each other's plans. <laughs> So I would defer, I would, I would lean towards the side of getting all the good quality information on the same plan and grab a certification from one person who's willing to do it. Okay, so that would be the um, engineers, probably the land design 
Okay. So we'll just take the one stamp. Um, I do notice on this same one that we're looking at, you do have a section that's called Planning Board Approval Notes. And I'm a little hesitant. We had that another time somebody tried to get our um, condition of approval. And I was concerned that um, you may miss something, or if you only put two and we actually had six, somebody might make an assumption, this was it. Uh, and at that time, they did actually take those off. Um, so there would be no confusion that these are the only two if there's actually more. I, I don't know how the board feels about that, but we typically don't see our condition of approvals on the plan. Okay, yeah, I'm, you know, the, the, the less the merrier, I'm, I'm. Yeah, it cleans it up a little. Yeah. Um, I'm glad you're changing it from Bella's way because um, actually the right of way is called which come up. It is. That's the name of the right of way. So I'm glad it's, being, it's going back to and not being changed to. So thank you very much for doing that. I was going to request that be done. Uh, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not clear. I'm sorry. I have a question about, you said that the, um, are you calling them which property? Front property, back property? Do you have property A, B? I'm not so sure what you're referring this to. This property, uh, Kevin owns this property right here. Right. And that's the existing house. Okay. The lot line is this uh, so magenta line right here. The lot line goes right down that, is that a driveway right there I'm looking at? Or is uh, that the turnaround? This would be the, right, this would be the uh, hammerhead constructed at the end of our new private, our proposed private access way. So depending on who builds a house and what kind of house it is and exactly where it is, they could take the driveway off here or they could take the driveway off here. Um, they have the option. Uh, we're not proposing a, a, to build a house there at the moment, so. Why don't you put the lot line right down the middle of the, of the hammerhead? Is that normal? Um, well, I don't know if it is or not, but I, what I was trying to do was not take up, this is a pretty small building window, so we're backed up against the wetland so we're trying to preserve as much space as we could for the building window and at the same time give them as much space in the back. So it seemed a, you know, a happy medium to uh, locate the uh, hammerhead right there. Okay, would there have to be an agreement? Or yes. Sure? Uh, have to be, so the, the guy in the front house got to shovel half the driveway in the back? There already has to be a road maintenance agreement. For and this property, and that so. would cover that. Okay, I, I was just confused. So that, so that's not the driveway. As I say, you, it, you, a turnaround can't be. The fire chief doesn't want that to be somebody's driveway. Okay, well, so you, the driveway's you, not in there. You can have a driveway off of a turnaround if you put it on the right side, and, you, and, and there's a side where you can put it on where it's okay. Okay, but the driveway's not shown. No, and we usually, we usually don't see the driveway. We usually see a private yeah, access way to the lot line. Um, and, and the only time they tend to show you a driveway into the lot is when they're putting the turnaround on the lot. Okay. I, I was just confused and I didn't understand why the lot line goes right down the middle of that too. So, I'm sorry, I was just confused, confused about that. Um, and where did you say you were going to put this CMP line? The, the um, whole discussion about we yes, prefer, we yeah. prefer, we prefer. Let me go with that. Was, I'm sorry guys, I was just a little confused. So, after our meeting with CMP um, this morning, we would like to put attached to this pole and put a service line down this side. We will obviously need an easement from this front parcel and cross through uh, our no disturb <laughs> buffer into our building window. And what about the um, neighbors? How would they get to their back lot? Uh, they, there's a pole right there. They could do the same thing with a service line. And they would have to dig up this or would they uh, be on the side? They would go right down the side of the uh, road. Okay. Uh, is there any, because you went through um, CMP, water, I'm not sure if there was one other. Uh, um, sewer. And sewer. Would the neighbors have to dig up that road at all to put in any of those three? Uh, no, we're proposing that we would stub the force main sewer, we would up the size and stub the force main sewer at the end of this private access way, and that the water and the electric would come down outside the pavement, um, should they ever be needed. But we would not be doing that. 
we would be making sure that our utilities are as far over to this side of the street as uh, the access way as possible, and we would not be doing anything with the um, with future power and water. Okay, I just wanted to make sure they didn't have to. They they would just be digging into the side of the road, not into the road. Uh, last question. Um, I like the idea of boulders. I don't know if anybody else does, and if um, if the rest of the board is okay with that, I think they should appear on the plot and, and have a size to them so that we all know when, when we talk boulder, if we're talking boulder, boulder. And I don't know how the rest of the board feels I'm, about something I like that. I am also in favor of boulders. And if you'd like to know the reason why we're in favor of this, um, you missed last month's meeting. Um, we, have a, we had a situation where someone built their house right to the line of the wetlands, so they walk out off their patio and they're in the wetlands. And we want to avoid that from happening. So uh, boulders would be much appreciated. And our building, uh, our no disturb building window doesn't help with that. Go ahead. Um, our big problem is that people love their homes, they love to landscape, and they landscape right into the wetland. <laughs> And uh, what we've come up with is, you know, you place a boulder yep. like once every 50 feet, it okay. becomes a very clear visual reminder that you need to stop mowing when you get to the boulder. Okay. Yeah, we understand. Thank you, Carolyn. That was it. Go ahead. I'm sorry for the lateness, but if I understood correctly, Peter, the private road is going to be 18 feet wide and it's going to be paved. Correct. And then the private access way is going to be 18 feet wide. Is that going to be gravel or paved? Paved. Okay. So one of the things that the um, abutters, the Clarks, have asked for is some benefit from the fact that this is being constructed and that um, private road be built to their, their property. And if the board is willing to grant approval for the entire length as a private road, rather than half private road, half private access way, that would satisfy one of the requests that the clerks have made. So since they're being built to the same standard, why not call it a private road all, all the, the way? way. Um, you make sense to me. So I guess the, the only difference would be the, uh, currently the private access way has, I think, thir three inches less of uh, base gravel. I think it's 15. For a private road, it's 15 inches of sub-base, 6 inches of base, and then the pavement, the private access way is 15 inches of sub-base, 3 inches of base, and pavement. So we would need to uh, increase the, uh, the base gravel. Or ask for a waiver. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Any other questions? Excuse me, Maureen. You're just you're just suggesting that the entirety of what they're showing be built, uh, be approved at, uh, as a roadway and not yes. an access it, way. You're, you're not suggesting that we approve a roadway all the way to where they the correct. Um, I'm access. suggesting that they okay. build it exactly the way they're showing to you right now that they designate, they change the plan to call the whole thing a private road and you grant a private road approval. Okay. Because that, I mean, you could, in order to get to the lot, potential lots in the back of the Clarks, you might need to extend that roadway. And, and you might need to. And the question is, how much do you ask this applicant to do? How much do you try to accommodate the Clarks? And this is something that's not asking the applicant to spend any more money. It's just an approval that you grant. Okay. Anything else before we schedule a site walk? <laughs> so it's getting dark earlier. It's supposed to rain next week. 
It's looking good for dates. You want to go tonight or on the weekend? Do we want to go? People want to go evening or on a Saturday? Evening for me would be after five. Me too. We know the dark by It's dark by yeah. six fifteen, six thirty. I could go earlier, but I don't think anybody else can. Do we need it five? Can you make it there by five? Yes. I could do five, but hmm. depending what day it is. How okay. about Monday the 23rd? This coming Monday? At five o'clock, you're proposing? I can do that. Yeah, <clears throat> I can do that. How does that work for you guys? Just want to let Good. you know. Five forty-four is sunset on Monday, October twenty-third. <laughs> so we walk. You can still see after sunset. I'm just letting you know. <laughs> well, so we're not too deep in the woods. <laughs> so, are we good? I think with? we did Maxwell Woods in one hour, right? We did, but it was getting dark when we left. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of acreage. Those we are pretty short now. space to examine. I think. So you should be able to do it now. Are we? Are we good? Does that yeah. work? Yeah, what date is Monday? Monday is the 23rd. Thank you. <laughs> Just pack a dinner. Yeah, yeah. I'll be hungry. Oh, you've got a meeting? Because yes. you are, you're due someplace else at 6.30. But, all right, 5 p.m. on October 23rd? 5 p.m. on the 23rd. Does that work? Yeah, great. Okay. Is it all right if we park in your Absolutely. driveway? No, I'll make sure the funny part. Thank you. Okay, thanks. All right, and this is open to the public. Uh, so, all right. So next thing is a motion for public hearing. Oh, Go ahead. Uh, motion to public hearing. Table of public hearing. Bid order that. Excuse me. Based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of KTO LLC, Kevin O'Donovan, for review to construct a private road and private access way to be named Edgecombe Road uh, to provide access to a new lot located at the rear of 75 Ocean House Road be tabled to the regular November 21st, 2017 meeting of the planning board, at which time a public hearing will be, public hearing will be held. Second. Uh, Thirty seconds. Any discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, I know it is ten o two. What's going on? You, in order to take up the last item, you would need to um, suspend the rules. So we need to. Motion to suspend the rules. Thank you. The motion to suspend the rules. Second. Henry seconds. All right. All those in favor? Okay. It's unanimous. He means to not let someone that they <coughs> after he spent so patient and waited through all this. All right. Next item on the agenda. Old Sea Point Road Pelletier Amendment. Scott and Julie Pelletier are requesting an amendment to the previously approved old Sea Point Road private road approval to replace a proposed private well with a public water line to serve the lot located at 19 Old Sea Point Road, section 19-7-9B, new private road completeness and public hearing. So we'll start with completeness. places a pretty plan so the applicant is um, accessing his email so that he can show a digital plan up on the okay wall behind us why don't you so I haven't made you do this for any of the others why don't you give a little summary Maureen while he's Be happy to get my summary um, so this is the last lot on Old Sea Point Road, and, and I mean by last lot, the lot at the end of the road, and probably the last lot you will see. And for those of you who've been on the board a while, you know that Old Sea Point Road is a frequent flyer in front of the planning board. It's been in front of you many times. 
Um, it's a private road that started off as a private drive. It was a uh, poster child for poorly constructed private roads. It was uh, required to be repaired and brought up to a minimum standard by the planning board in 2014. And the at the time, the furthest lot was proposed to be served by a well. Uh, the, the, the owners of the lot are now requesting that they be allowed to install public water instead, which as you all know, is, I'm a big proponent of public utilities. They are much more reliable. So because the plan shows a well, this would be an amendment to the plan and that's what being requested tonight. And I just want to make sure the board understands that this private road includes rights for this lot to install utilities in the private right of way. So with that, I will conclude. <laughs> You're done. <laughs> Did you get the plan up? Yes, yeah, plan's up, yep. Yeah. So, uh, like Maureen said, um, uh, the proposed water line is, here's Old Sea Point Road, here's our client's lot up here. So currently all of the, there's the water lines and some power come along this side of Old Sea Point Road. Um, our proposed new water line will be on the south side of Old Sea Point Road and come across. Uh, one driveway, they cut across um, Old Sea Point Road, and they go along this side, uh, cut across another driveway, and then up our client's driveway into their property. Um, so it's a trench that we're going to be excavating. Uh, we will any driveway or pavement will, that we disturb will be patched back to industry standards. The same with any. Uh, lawns, grass, uh, any disturbed areas will be patched and repaired to industry standards. Uh, all connections will be done to uh, installation standards at Portland Water District. We also have the Portland Water District's uh, letter as well, which we provided to the town for approval of this new service. And uh, we went to the workshop on October 3rd, and there was a couple of questions that came up. And I want to address those tonight as well. One question was, could you bring the water line from Old Ocean House in 77 and bring it up to the lot because Old Ocean House is on the back side of this lot here, or 77 is. And the answer is, it's a lot more costly to bring it from 77 than it is through the already existing right away. There was ledge, there was more disruptive uh, to the traffic in Cape Elizabeth as well, and uh, just a lot more economically feasible to bring it through Old Seapoint Road. And then the other comment from the workshop was, could you drill um, the water line instead of excavating for a trench? And we had several vendors go out to the site and review, and we got pricing back, and this was also not economically uh, feasible because um, the potential conflicts with some of the existing utilities that are already there along this side and also the potential for ledge is a very ledgy site so we could obviously can't drill the ledge and then also um, just the overall cost of it where will increase so i think that's really it excuse me yes you haven't identified oh i'm rob barrett Okay, thank you. Yep. Right. Yes. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak to completeness of this project plan? Please come forward and state your name and uh, address, and please try to keep your comments to three minutes. Hi, my name is Sarah Haskell. I live um, at 4 Old Sea Point, which is um, on the side that they would initially start with. Is that southbound? South, yeah. Yep, southbound, which is tearing up my driveway to go northbound to their road. Um, I just want to make it clear I'm not opposed to public water. I think it's important to have public water. Would you lower the microphone? I can't hear you very well. Oh, sure, sorry. 
Um, I do have some concerns um, that I just would like to be addressed um, before moving forward with this. Um, the first one is the 40-foot easement that um, would potentially take out some of my oak trees along the way. I mean, it is an easement, so I'm, I have a question about that. Um, and then I wanted to question whether we could do, the, or, or reinforce the need maybe for a performance guarantee done through a third party, if that's possible. Um, <clears throat> and then my last concern is that I do have small children and choosing to go southbound and then northbound um, could cause some harm to them depending on how deep the trench is and, and what exactly that will look like and the time frame. Um, we, this is very personal, but we have a birthday party planned for two weeks with probably 20 cars in the driveway, so if they're tearing up both sides of the road, um, I guess we just really need some communications with the neighbors because we just have no idea what's going on. So, okay. thank you. Hi, my name is Sophie Park. We, I am the resident of 12 OC Point Road. Um, our house was just built um, less than a year ago and it's directly south of the driveway of 19 OC Point Road. And um, I think our major concern is access. If, if this construction is going on, our concern is whether we are going to have an access to our garage. We have an electric vehicle. My husband and I have each commute uh, at least 80 mi miles each way. So I go to Boston, he goes to Waterville. And we do that every day and we have electric vehicle. So we need an access to our garage where, where our charging station is. So if this construction is going to prevent us from having that access, it's going to devastate our um, work routine. Um, second is the timing is uh, winter's approaching. Please, please talk to us. Yes, so winter is fastly approaching and uh, it is just my observation and I have nothing um, against whoever is doing the, the work, but um, we are worried about the delay in the work and with a uh, couple with the winter weather with frozen road conditions, I just don't know how long it's going to take and we would like to have some sort of guarantee of timeline of the completion. Um, I think that's, I think, between Sarah and our concern that pretty much sums everything up. Okay. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Right. I'm going to close the public comment period and turn it over to the board for questions. This is completion. Completion. I, don't yep. completion. I have a question. Go ahead. Um, is it, don't we usually get details for trenching, cutting, matching? Go ahead. Yes, we usually do, but this applicant is having the work done by the water district. So that's like the only exception because it's a water line and it's got to be done to water district standards and they're taking can they're taking control of the construction okay oh, interesting okay anything any i have a question someone mentioned trees there's been no mention of the potential loss of trees in this plan is that a, is that possible um we're not intending to take down any trees There'll be, there's no plan to cut any trees. No. Okay. Yep. Go ahead. Peter. Yeah, I don't know if this is completion or later, but the uh, when you do a job like this and you're cutting off a driveway, yep. uh, what is the typical downtime once you hit the put your trencher across the driveway? It's, it's probably a couple hours through a driveway. So I'll address. Uh, I don't know if I address their questions now or should we? Your trench isn't very wide. Okay. No, it's a bunch no. of wide. It's 18 okay. inches wide. Yeah. 
So. Okay. Go ahead. Address their questions now. Okay. Yeah. So uh, for the electric car neighbor, um, there'll be downtime. There'll be some downtime, but across the street would be the only really downtime that would affect you guys getting in and out of Old Sea Point. So that would only be a couple hours worth. And again, uh, the communication piece, we're going to, like I said before, we'll, before we get this approved, we'll put together a schedule and make sure you guys are all aware of when we're going to start and stop and hopefully work around birthdays. Our goal is to not disrupt the neighbors. Okay. All right. Uh, go ahead, Tori. No, not in completion, but... Uh, go ahead. But... Um, so uh, somebody else is actually doing the work. How much say do, then do you have over them doing the work? It was pulling water that's doing the well, work. Pulling water is just doing, yeah, the meter tap, doing, yeah. And so I don't understand um, the whole complex, who's in charge, who tells who, when. So Skip start. Murray, who is, do, is doing our site work, who does, as you know, I'm sure you've heard, he does most of Cape work, so he's doing our site work for us. Okay, so as you tell the neighbors, like, uh, don't worry, we'll be right, so communicating. We'll have, yeah, exactly. So we'll have a pre-construction meeting with Skip on site and say, you know, this is what we're, here's, here's our plan, how long is it going to take, how is it going to affect this neighbor, that neighbor, and then we'll put together a plan and we'll communicate it to them. And when do you think you may start this? Well, we're hoping to start in late October, early November. We like it when the ground's a little cold. So it's not so you know without rain, so muddy on people's lawns. It's better when it's a little colder. Okay. I don't have a lot of questions. I, I think they asked about the trees. Um, I heard something about a performance guarantee. Um, I didn't quite catch that. Did you catch that about performance guarantee? Well, it's. I mean, it's a little bit awkward. I mean, when we did the original site. Uh, work we required a performance guarantee to have the road upgraded because the town had a um, compelling interest to get the road fixed so that we could provide emergency access to those properties. This is not in the road, it's adjacent to the road. And if you require a performance guarantee, you're putting the town in the position of inspecting what is wholly a private enterprise. Okay, and I'm yeah. pretty sure that the people who will be doing that won't be happy with me. But definitely, if you want to require a performance guarantee, you can do that. I heard it brought up, and I, I've i never known us to do a performance guarantee on something like this. It's just and we usually the don't, and, and yeah. OK, uh, I'm just trying to get all the, most of it was time frame, timeline, time in the winter, and the performance guarantee. And okay, just, really just for information, to put some minds at ease, um, when you're working, and you trench, you don't leave at the end of the day with an open trench. No. Trenches are covered yep. at their, at the end of the work day or exactly. filled, filled yep. in. Yep. yep. So I didn't want anyone to think there'd be open trenches no, no open along trenches, the yeah. road. That's not safe. It's good. No. All right. Motion. Go ahead. He had ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Robert Barrett. Uh, oh, you think sorry. you're you're jumped ahead? Yeah. Oh, sorry. My apologies. Finding um, motion for the board to consider. Finding of fact one: Robert Barrett, on behalf of Scott and Julie Palladier, requesting an amendment to Old Seaport Road subdivision to allow public water to be installed in place of a private well for the lot located at 19 Old Sea Point Road, 18-4, which requires review under section 16-2-5 amendments to previously approved subdivisions. Two, public water is a preferred source of a clean and healthful supply of water for new development. Three, the planning board agreed in the <coughs> October 3rd, 2017 workshop to expedite the amendment require request in order to facilitate installation and repairs for the road, driveways, and lawns to be done as soon as possible before winter arrives. For lot 18-4 has deeded rights of access and for installation of utilities within Old Seaport Road right of way. Five, the application substantially complies with section 16-2-5 amendments to previously approved subdivisions. 
be it ordered back based on the plans and materials submitted and the fact presented, the application of Robert Barrett on behalf of Scott and Julie Pudderkamp to amend Old Seaport Road subdivision to extend public water to the lot located at 19 Old Seapoint Point Road, 18-4, be approved. Second. Jim seconds. Any further discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Now that we've suspended, do I do I have to do a public comment on things going on in the All right. Now, is there any? Now is the time for public comment on anything that was not on the agenda. <laughs> is there anyone? I'm going to go real fast. All right. I don't see anybody. So now I'm looking for another motion. Good. Motion to adjourn. A motion to adjourn. Jim seconds. All those in favor? Aye. Yay. Yeah.